I'm straight up shitting in front of people, dude. I'm like, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. You are listening to the bomb. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb. I'm going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. Another day in the booth. Stony Buds, how we doing? The temperature is right. You know what I mean, Doc? For the listeners, it is freezing cold in the here today. The cooler. We're in the ice box, and I'm actually wearing... Um, an Olympic gold medal right now. Woo! Courtesy of our guest, Sage Kotzenberg. Sage, how we doing? We're doing good. I was always uh, wondering what kind of chair situation you guys got back here. I didn't know if he was like, you guys going to leisure living? You guys, they're, they're nice. They're good. Let's be honest. They're, they're trash. These things, are, <laughs> these things have been sitting outside, like rusting for about three summers, four summers. A couple people got yeah. booster seats too. Yeah. Yeah. So if you need one, let us know. You're looking good though. <laughs> no, it's feeling good. It feels right. Are, are you ready to embark on a banter marathon, a banter journey, if you Let's will? Let's go. Let's take a journey. Okay, well, let's start off this journey with where you're from. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Park City, Utah. Uh, I lived there since I was two. My parents are from uh, Southern California. They were surf rats their whole life, pretty much. My dad was a weekend warrior at, like, June Mountain, Mammoth Mountain. So they bailed on California, came to Utah, and, uh, yeah, we started ripping when we were kids. And my mom and dad were so down with that because – they kind of, I mean, they lived that life, you know, they really, I think my dad really wanted me to be a pro surfer, honestly, and we were settling for snowboarding now, you know, um, but yeah, it was cool. I mean, getting taken out of school early to go rip, my parents would take me out, you know, school was always a priority, but it was also like, they wanted us to have fun. They wanted us to go rip and, and have a good time and really like have that, what they, what they had at the beach, you know, like we really took that vibe to the mountains. I heard your, your older brother, Blaze, was, uh, he was better than you as a kid as well. Dude, Blaze was a beast on the board, straight up. I was always, I mean, little brother syndrome, you know? Um, I was always trying to beat him. I was always, you know, I was, I'm two and a half years younger, so he would learn a trick. And then, you know, I would always consider myself lucky because he would learn stuff, this and that. And I would be, you know, two and a half years ahead. Okay, well, you got that trick. I, I'm seeing how he's doing it. I'm seeing how he's learning it. And I would just implement that into my my life and my snowboarding, and you know I would learn the tricks faster, and it it was definitely a good good progression for sure because he was always pushing himself, and I was just trying to beat my older brother and everything that whether it's video games, snowboarding, skating, or, you know whatever it was, I was trying to beat Blaze. Yeah, that kind of maybe gave the competitive edge at a young age for but sure. You, you you just released this edit of you when you were a kid, and. Uh, you're putting an absolute beat down on those boxes, dude. <laughs> dude. Can we talk about that box? <laughs> Boxzilla. Dude, just <laughs> absolute beat down. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I just dropped that 14 year old at it at the NGMT track. Oh, heat. who didn't? Yeah, absolute heat. heat. Abs 08. That was mm -hmm. a good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was 08. Um, yeah, dude. I mean, that's really, I mean, when I was, you know, growing up, I was definitely, you know, Good at snowboarding for sure. I mean, it took took me a bit to get used to it. Blaze was always a little bit more naturally talented than me, and I always really had to work hard for for all this stuff. Like, it didn't come as quick as him. Like, he was so fluid, you know. I was always so jealous of that. And, like, you know, he always said I had, like, he, like I would always have this, like, kind of bunk steez when I was little. I looked like, you know, my hands were, like, dragging on the ground, and he was looking so fluid. So um, right about when I was 14, I kind of grew, grew into my body a little bit more, and then I became crazy goal-oriented, and I can literally remember the the sheet of paper I taped on my mom and dad's fridge of the tricks I wanted to learn when I was 14. It was it was pretty gnarly. It was all four 900s, a back 10, and a cab 12. It was 08. I mean, it's like, no one was dropping cab 12s. I just had it on because I, I wanted to have something that I probably wasn't going to be able to do, but to strive for, you know? And so I remember that year I got all three nines and a back 10. And I actually got the back 10. We were in, I would always go to Mammoth. We'd go to Mammoth for like a month. Everyone thought we were from Mammoth, you know? We'd always always have Mammoth footy in our edits and all this stuff. And people literally thought we were from there. We were with Flanagan and Trevor Jacob and major shout outs to the Dawood brothers. All three, like TJ, Alex, uh, Jared, like those are the homies. So um, yeah, we were, we were in Mammoth when I was 14 and we were in the springtime. And um, I was working my ass off trying to, because Dude, Tyler Flanagan was, he was top dog for, you know, like my, my age group. 
And um, I was like, I was for for sure like low key jealous of like everything. He, you know, I wanted I wanted that so bad, and I saw how hard he would always work. So when I'd get to Mammoth, it was kind of like it was like Super Bowl. It was like, okay, like let's show up right now. Let's like this is the time to like ride with Tyler and them and learn as much stuff as I could. And from that, I got invited. I was like kind of kind of just like trying to work my way with bridges and stuff. And, you know, we'd been to the launch and whatever. It was like maybe the first year of the launch, like shooting with stone and everything. And bridges basically gave me the nod. He was like, you know what? Like you, you can come to Super Park. And I took that as like, this is my opportunity to show up right now. And it was when, I don't know if you remember the Super Park, it was Super Park 13, it was on the backside of Mammoth. And oh, yeah. The, like the Sun and Berserker jump, the like 100 foot step that down. That was a really sick That one. was the jump I learned back tens on. It was like the 100 foot step Holy down. Shit. <laughs> Son of Berserker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Son of Berserker. And so it was kind of the end of the session. It was right when, um, it was when T. Rice, Shalone Miller, Shouts. Shalone. Yeah. Um, and Pat Moore were hitting this like big 120 oh, I foot. I remember dude. that, dude. dude that was an gnar- epic super. Gnarly a sunset session. So all the cameras were toward, were towards that because they were about to start sessioning. And I chucked back 10. I landed it first or second try. And no one filmed it. <laughs> dude, and it was Whoops. like, dude, I hit up every single filmer. Cause I got the list of like every filmer was there and I straight up emailed all of them. Like, do you have that clip? Do you have that clip? I was being Nobody. Like, annoying little kid. Like, do you have that clip of me doing the back 10? Everyone's like, no, I got the back nine. I was like, Shit, dude, like that was my because everyone moved to the other session. Everyone moved. all 40 filmers. All 40 <laughs> filmers. But that was it was so sick. And then just sat down and watched those dudes send it. But that was a huge year for me where I was like, okay, hey, I think I can really get this going. You know, I'm at the level of a lot of these other guys. And, you know, seeing them in person too, get I think that helps so much. Like getting to see like Travis Rice in person putting it down on the jumps, everything became attainable after that, you know? That, no, that's you're amazing. on his level in your mind, I guess. Now you're at the same shoot, jumping the same jumps with the same media. 100%. I remember you showing up too and – that year, that was insane. That Super Park was incredible. Yeah, That's, I think I got a minor threat that year. Yeah, I think too. you did as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, or an on deck area. On and deck I remember the launch yeah. too that you're at. That's yep. so sick. Yeah, and once Pat gives you the nod, it, it's on. Totally. Especially into those sessions with that caliber of riders. Huh. One hundred percent. Yeah. I mean those those are things that make it when you're a kid. You get the nod. Yeah, a nod from Bridges, and you're with the young bucks. But then you're looking at the older dudes, and I mean. Straight up, I was looking at them like, I'm going to come clown on you guys one day. You know, I was just like that. I wanted to be at that level so bad, you know, and that became a thing for me where I always wanted to, I wanted to prove people wrong that weren't even saying that. I was, <laughs> you didn't even need to. Yeah, I didn't even need to, you Some know. MJ shit. Yeah. yeah. Were yeah, you totally. actually checking the fridge when you landed these tricks? Oh, yeah. I was for <laughs> sure check che- yeah, checking them off. And you know, I still to this day do a lot of goals. And I, I write them down. And even if they're in your, and even if you're in your like phone, on your iPhone, if you have your notepad, just like write down goals that are, you know, super attainable and then not that attainable. But that really went into when I was like 15, my mom and dad pretty much gave me, you know, it's really expensive snowboarding, you know, and they, they had, they had blaze who was about to go to college and they had my younger sister Kira, who's like a super good ripper as well. My mom was like, Hey, if you, you know, you kind of got to put it on this year and, and make this, ha- you know, make something happen so we can keep this going and, and get some support from sponsors. So I went off when I was 15, I learned all these new tricks, I learned like back 12 cat, like cab 12s and stuff. And I went to all the opens around around the world pretty much. And I started doing pretty good at those. And I was taught, I was trying to tell the, it was right when do tour was starting when I was 15 and I wanted to be in the do tour so bad, like Torstein, Andreas, Chaz Goldbond, all the big dogs were in it, Sean White. And I went, I went to the do tour. I didn't get in or I maybe got like an, a very last minute spot and it was snowing, but I waited in line for hours and I was bugging the dude to her people like, can I get in like I have this you know edit you know I'm with my mom she's there like supporting me and I'm like I want to do this like I'm at the level of these people I swear you know and just grinding I think they finally gave me a spot I like knuckled all the jumps you know snowing I felt so defeated but then I took that energy and just really put it into when I was 15 you know really trying to make it a point that I I'm at this level of these other people you know and it didn't quite click that year, but everyone kind of started seeing me go down the contest and saying, like, okay, this kid's pretty good. I remember Mason Aguirre was one. And he was like, he's like, yo, dude, you're like, you're ripping, man. I was like tripping that Mason was saying that to me. And so the next year, you know, I, I had all these new tricks when I was 15 
and I was in the do to where I got a spot. I had to go from the pre qualifiers, qualifiers, semis, finals. I made it all the way. I got second. And it was like Tyler got first and Eric Willett got third. And, you know, like Andreas was there, uh, Torstein, Chaz Goldemont, Haldor was in it. You know, it was with all the big dudes. So when I was 16, I, that, I took that second place and I was like, dude, it's game on. Like, let's go. <laughs> and that whole season, I ended up, I ended up at getting X Games. Um, you know, getting that invite was crazy. I remember being at my house just literally tripping out because I used to record every X games dude on the VHS and I would run those till the tapes ran out straight up. Like as long I'd go videos too, but I would watch these contest runs. They're like, how do these guys get so consistent? You know, and you could tell these repetition. And so I took that same mentality. I was like, dude, I'm going to X games. Like, you know, I didn't, I got like fifth or sixth or something was kind of crazy, you know, 16, but I think I got second at the European one, but I ended up that year winning the Duke cup, which was crazy. I was tripping out, you know, I was like, you know, be beating or, you know, at the same level as the dudes like tour sign stuff. And they really kind of took me under their wing as being really cool about it. You know, like, cause I, I didn't know I, everything seemed f like fake to me that I was around, you know, it didn't really feel like I was there with these guys, you know, and they fully took me under their wing and were so cool and really helped me out, which was so rad feeling that camaraderie and snowboarding, like the young kid coming up, you know, I wanted to beat all them so bad. And they were like, yeah, come on, dude. Like, let's go. Let's go on this. They were like, let's do this. You can <laughs> yeah. I don't care if you beat me. Whatever. Yeah, totally. It was really, it was really cool. Cause now I look back at, you know, younger kids that probably the same drive and determination. And I, I, I want to do the same thing. You know, I always want to take them under my wing, like help them out in any way I can, you know? And a couple incredible things I heard as you were talking. I wanted to kind of yeah, touch, just kind of rant. On. This went out in oh, pretty okay, good. Dude, rant. That was yeah. a banter god <laughs> over there. <laughs> the two dummies could just be <laughs> here in the booth, and you just go, dude. Straight up, just let them just <laughs> wind to, them up uh, and let the banter yeah. ensue. But the thing that I think is really fucking cool. One thing I want to touch on is that like somebody like yourself. They a lot of people would say, "Oh, he's so talented. He's different than me." Right? A lot of people right. hide behind talent as, "Oh, he has something I don't have." Like, th yeah. this person's different than I am because they're more talented. And from what I hear, A, like, you're you're just a, a workhorse, basically. And, totally. and another part of that, too, is um, that goal setting and the lists and accomplishing things. There's a book called Mind Gym. Not to be some fucking self-righteous book person, but I read this EJAC interview back in the day. And um, he, he talked about how he read this book called Mind Gym. And his whole career changed. And he got that last part in People. And he just blew the fuck up. And um, I read that book. It did the same. Like, it had a huge impact on my career. It's all about goal setting and right. stuff like that. And I know Jill Perkins and all kinds of people have read it. So if you're looking for something as far as, like, goal setting and, and kind of, like, Sage was talking about the list of the cab nines on the fridge, pick up Mind Gym. It's fucking great. And then also I want to talk about that that work ethic versus talent situation. Yeah. No, totally. I mean, I think people are so scared of using the, like, working hard as something. Like, like talent is something that maybe they don't have. But, I mean, dude, you can beat, like I just was saying, like, Blaze was so much more naturally talented at snowboarding, and he had some unfortunate injuries that kind of just put him back, you know? But I would look at him and be like, well, I can work, I can work harder, or just, like, go longer. I would, dude, I would hike jumps on a powder day when I was a kid, which is, I look back, and I'm like, that's whack. Park jumps? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe it helped me land in pow now, I don't know. But I would straight <laughs> hike these jumps, dude, all day. I'd hike rails, because I wanted... I didn't have the full, just raw, natural talent. I really had to put in a lot of work where Blaze could show up and do the illest tricks and look good while doing it. And I was like, man, dude, I, I want to do that too, you know, but I would have to put in a little extra work. So like talent isn't just something that other people have and you don't have, you know, like you need to work for that too. Some people are more naturally talented, but if you work hard beats talent, man, it's, it's straight up, it can. Always. I think almost it's undefeated against talent, yeah. I would say. Totally. And then yeah. at, there's a certain point where you're going to get to the point where you have the talent and then you, you still maintain that hard work ethic where I think that's where a lot of people, they get to that point and then they relax, you know, like, okay, that was, I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm pro or like I made it to the NBA. I'm going to, I'm going to sit back. But what really defines greatness from the average person is like, what are you willing, what are you willing to do with the average person won't? Like, are you willing to risk more than them? It doesn't mean like an injury rate or anything like that. Like, but are you willing to put more on the table than they they are? And it comes back and folds, man. It's it's so crazy what hard work can do. You yep. think there's a lot of talented people 
that don't step up because they're talented. They feel like they don't have to. It comes too easy. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. I've, I've had this conversation with some other people because you see, you see so many people that are so naturally talented. It comes so easy that they almost, they don't have that grit behind them. You know, they don't have that. They don't have that hike, <laughs> hike a jump every time because they're like, dude, it comes easy to me. Why should I be yeah. hiking this jump, man? Or but, why do I got to build with these guys all day? I can yeah, just go totally. natty over here and whatever. Totally. I've you seen s- that a little bit. You see with anyone in any sport, whether it's a Tom Brady or Michael Jordan, these dudes are working their ass off every all day. Like in that MJ documentary, it says they lost in the finals. Mm-hmm. That when you're, They didn't go on vacation. It went straight back to the gym. It's like, dude, there's just levels to it, you know? And it's like, where do you want to fit in? And... If you want to be the top, then don't settle with mediocrity. That's beautiful. And the thing that also people don't see is that, you know, look at where you're at, what you're doing. They see, they see you win rider of the year or they see you win, you know, the Olympics and all this shit. And they don't see what goes in behind the scenes. Like I I see you every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, putting in work at the gym and we'll get into it later. (laughs) I've seen you put in work in the gym and then run a half marathon and like, and then go to an Avi course that weekend or whatever. But it's like, you know, it's always happening and we should, we should get into that a little bit later. Yeah, totally. Going back to what you mentioned about um, Michael Jordan and, and uh, Tom Brady, you know, we were talking the other day about the loose usage (laughs) of the word goat. (laughs) Oh dude, (laughs) I can't, I, man, it's unreal. I don't know what's going on. The goat started. Yeah. As you know, it's greatest of all time. It's the Brady's, the MJ's, the Slater's, you know, all those people. And, it's just getting tossed around like a like a word now. Like an I, Australian uses legend. <laughs> yeah, dude, you'll see some some like pretty bunk ass clip on Instagram goat emojis on. I'm like, what are you talking? What? Somebody does a 50 50 front one. There's just a goat emoji underneath. <laughs> You're like, okay, 50 50 front side one. Yeah, no, yeah, that's got to end. That's 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 the top tier. You can't be just throwing that around on anything that. It's like everyone ruin everyone ruins the word. Yeah, like legend. You know, oh, you're a legend. You're a legend, but dude, you can't ruin goat. Yeah, goat. <laughs> there's gotta nothing be past goat. that. There's, <laughs> there's nothing. One. More. There's <laughs> one. It's sub- yeah. It can be subjective in snowboarding and skating and everything, but dude, you're talking about like a very very small you're, niche of people. Yeah. You're saying that this person is the greatest of all time to ever do it. <laughs> Let's be clear, because that's what goat stands yeah. for. Maybe people don't know what it fucking stands for. <laughs> I don't, that's I true. Think, yeah, maybe they're thinking that goats it's are cool just animals. <laughs> That Romp could be it true, around. though. You never know, man. You never know. People, are, people could be missing the people mark. See, people see it, and they're like, yeah, yeah, that guy's the GOAT. <laughs> well, I saw someone else use that shit. While we're on the subject of just quality banter right now, um, you guys have always been on some bullshit, whether it's like going home in cinders or... Um, <laughs> What's a cinder? Oh, you're going home. You got, cinder what, I have a list. I have yeah, yeah, yeah. beater season, yep. cinder season, Rambo season... First run cab nine. I mean, this is a little. We're going you, out of chronological. We need some layman breakdown. Yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I'll go. I'll go out of chronological here. Um, so I don't know. I, going back, I mean, it all kind of, you know, the goal oriented thing is kind of the kind of the centerfold of my life, you know. And so I, I kind of came what after the Olympics and everything, which we, which we can get into. But I kind of well, as I started going on this backcountry route, I started I started really needed some inspiration. And so um, it was actually the cinder season came from the John Cardiel interview where he's talking about skate and destroy. And they're asking him what skate and destroy means to him. And he says, you know, when you show up to the spot and you level it, you leave it in cinders. And so I was going to New Zealand and I was like, dude, this is cinder season. We're going to go down there and just chuck and that's it, dude. Like we're going to, yeah, anything you do was just leave it in ashes. Love that. <laughs> and so that's when we went down there. We were just chucking carcass left and right. That's when I did that back double 10 rewind to nine, the gimbal God filmed. Chucking that, ass. Like, yeah. Chucking ass. But that's, so that like motivated me. Then that went into when we were filming joy Rambo season. Cause you know, it was like me Ferg and in, in red, we can't p- put anything out mediocre. You know, it was like three dudes went to the Olympics making a video project. We came out with something mediocre. Like that would look bad on us. You know, we couldn't, you know, next time you're saying, like, yeah, let's put a video together, people will be like, let's look at your history, man. You put out that bunk-ass video last year. So we were all going into it like, hey, we need to really work our asses off right here and make something good and special. So that was Rambo season. And then uh, – What about yeah. be- beater season? <laughs> well, beater – yeah, beater season kind of went toe in, like hand-in-hand with uh, Skins In. So Skins In was – is like – We'd always go to New Zealand. We stay with Marcus Skin, who's the filmer, and Carlos Garcia and I, who are amazing people. And uh, we kind of just bunk up with them, like ten dudes in one house, two bedroom. It kind of takes you back to being, you know, younger, kind of like, 
you know, everyone's just living in the same place, dirty. Summer like, camp style. Yeah, summer yeah. camp style. So that was beater season because we'd all just wear beaters around the house for like three <laughs> weeks, dude. I love seeing when you guys are on these seasons. Bullshit. Oh, it's so good. I mean, that's what makes it so fun. Like that vibe goes out onto the mountain and then everyone's chucking and this and, and you're that. hyped. The oh, it's so up. good. It's like a crew vibe. It's awesome. Well, going back to your, you know, uh, road, let's call it the road to the Olympics. Yeah. Everybody knows you as Sage, the guy that won the fucking Olympics, right? And, and like, if you were to rewind before the Olympics, you weren't necessarily the fucking guy, right? And you didn't, you had a hard road to get there. Do you want to just talk about that road? It's not talked about enough. I don't yeah, think. totally. Yeah, I know, because everything coming up after the Olympics, after it all happened, it was kind of just... I don't know. They ask it's, they ask such boilerplate questions at all those things. You know, you get so used to talking about it. You have your answers to every question. You know, it's so crazy. I, I know Red was kind of talking about that. It's like you have your answers and you just leave it at that and you get on and you do the next interview. But yeah, going. I mean, when they <clears throat> when they announced that um, snowboarding slope style was going to be in the Olympics for 2014, I went right back into that state of mind. Like, all right, let's go. And I went straight back to my to my goals. You know, and these ones I didn't really necessarily write these down or anything, but there was like winning the gold medal was this like unobtainable thing, you know? And it was like, that was the end goal. But there's so many things you had to happen before. It's like, make the U S team like, okay, check that one off. Ma you know, make the quota points for the Olympics. Cause you have to do these FIS events that usually are subpar courses and like weird places with just, yeah, it was just pretty bad. But you had to, you had to go to these, all these places, get the points for your team because if you, you have to have like four people in the top 32 or something of the fist to have those four spots for your country. So you had to go do those the year before while doing all the other X games due to or all this other stuff. And then you check that off. Okay, I got my quota points. I'm good to go. That doesn't mean you're on the team though. So the year of the Olympics, you have to do the Grand Prix and other fist events to get one of the four spots on the team. So that was, I mean, that's like a full brawl for those spots, man. It's gnarly. So going into that year is, you know, I was feeling really good on my riding. I started doing these tricks with different grabs, trying to kind of differentiate myself a little bit because I wasn't, I was, I was kind of trying to chuck triples. They never were really working for me and like consistent. I'd always, I'd always be like kind of eating shit on them. And I was like, dude, I can't be pulling these in contests right now. I need to find, a, I need to find something that I can be different on that is equally as gnarly. So I started doing these crazy grabs, these tricks, these 12s or 14s, whatever it was, and putting those in my run, they were super well received. I got, you know, I was, I was one of the top people at, at every event, but it came down to this last event I needed to win. And I think going back, they misdid the numbers. I don't think I had to win. There was other con, there's other fist contests going on at the same time. It was a full fiasco. No one knew what was going on. So I went to the day of the last Grand Prix for the, for the last spot of the team saying like, do I need to win today or I'm not going to the Olympics pretty much, which is such a heavy burden to put on yourself. So like second or third run of the day, dude, I over, I, cause you'd go into these, you'd get in the routine and, and it kind of goes into the first run cab nine, you'd get to these events and dude, there's so many people there. There's, there's all, all the women are there, all the men are there all practicing at the same time. You have like an hour to practice so it's show up, do, you know, cab five, front seven, back seven. And then second run, it's like cab nine, front 10, back 10, cab 12, front 10, back 10. And then you're like, hey, cool, I'm good to go. Second run, I go for back 10. Second run of the day, it's like 8.15 in the morning. Go for back 10 off the last jump in Mammoth. Overshoot, land on my face, break my nose kind of. Like not bad, just like, you know, just like did something to my nose. Get in, I had to stop practicing because I'm bleeding all over the bottom of the court. So like, you need a concussion evaluation. I was like, dude, no, this is, this is crazy. This is not happening right now. I go into the main lodge of Mammoth. They're like doing a concussion protocol on me. And it was like, dude, it was, it was looking back. It was like a little loose, but the, the guy passed me. And so I didn't get one more run of practice. I did. I basically did one run warm up, and then ate shit on my face. And I was like, cool. I got to go drop bombs on this, broke you know? your nose and just <laughs> yeah dude my nose is all puffy i feel like crap i get up to the top and i'm like dude i just need to land this run and win and then just that's it and so i dropped in laced the run and that's the run i ended up winning on and yeah made made the team that day which was so it was like dude months and months of just kind of like stress anxiety of this like because dude you the olympics is 
the Olympics is so necessary in snowboarding because it has such a big audience and everything. I really do believe it helps snowboarding. But at the same time, you're also like, dude, this sucks. The, the qualifications wacky. These fist events was this like months and months of like anxiety building up about going to this one event that you might fall on both your runs, you know? And that was lifted off me. I'm like, dude, we made the team. Let's go. Let's go have fun now. Like, let's go. That's all done. Let's go have a good time and show people what snowboarding's all about at the Olympics. I, I want to rhyme, rewind back because talking to Blaze, he also mentioned the fact that <clears throat> you hadn't gotten a podium or a first place in like nine years before that, right? What? Yeah, dude, I never really. <laughs> even really, though you won <laughs> Dew Tour, you had overall points, right? Yeah, totally. Even ah. even on Dew Tour, I was getting seconds a lot. Everyone started calling me like second place age, and it was <laughs> kind of dope. I'll, I'll take second. Yeah. I became. I was like, oh, second's cool because first you have to do all the interviews. Second, you get some dough. You get some. You know, you don't have to do as many interviews. You can just go walk off, hang out, party, have a good time, and that's it. <laughs> but then, uh, actually, I got to give major shouts to Bill Enos actually because <laughs> he came on the U.S. team, and I had never. I've had coaches growing up, like kind of you know people from Milo or this and that, but I never mm -hmm. had a full on coach, and I actually really despise coaches and snowboard. I thought coaches were the wackest thing to ever happen to snowboarding, that they shouldn't be at the top of the courses, that it was turning snowboarding into this really whack event. And Billy knows completely flipped my switch on that. Me and him butted heads so hard when he first got on the US team and he was new to he was new to the US team. I was new to the US team and we just butted heads. I literally I like I told him not to be at the top of the course with me. <laughs> dude is gnarly because like hey bill you know for people i don't know he's he's coached or ridden and just been around with everyone from pat moore to to me to he's been he's east coast just legend legend <laughs> actual actual legend he's a goat. agreed, agreed. <laughs> actually as far as coaching as far as coaching he is he might be we yeah, might you throw him you, on the I goat status could, i would throw i'll, him I'll toss there. goat emoji on that yeah, one all right I'll, let's I'll go to emoji, emoji him. Him. But he really opened my eyes up. He's like, dude, you're straight up scared to win. And I took that, I always took that so bad at first. Like, what are you talking about? I'm scared to win. I've been working my ass off so hard. Like, how dare you say that? And he was like, no, dude, every event you do what it takes to get on the podium. He's like, you're not doing what it takes to beat everyone else no matter what. And I was going, and so going to the Olympics, I really had that mentality. I was like, dude, I really want, I really want to win, you know, because everything around the Olympics became this thing where it was like, is it cool? Is it whack? You know, style versus technicality. And it really became this issue. I was stuck in the middle. Everyone's like, Oh, I really like your style. I'm like, dude, style. Like, I mean, dude, we're doing tens and twelves. They're not really that cool looking anyways. You know, I was like, I was caught in this weird middle. I don't know. I don't even know how to explain it. It was like kind of in the middle of both worlds of the technicality side and the style side where people were really like banking on me of going to the Olympics and, like bringing style to the Olympics. I was like, dude, like that just sounds whack. Stop saying that. <laughs> you know, I was so over it. But so I got there and, and me and Bill, he told me, he was like, yo, let's roll up into a little ball. We'll be our own unit. And pretty much we started, he started saying, he was like, everyone was like, fuck everyone else. You're like we're here. Like as a unit, there's so much other people there. Like all these all these other, you know, BBCs there at the bottom trying to interview, like, this course suck. Like, you know, all this stuff was going around. The course was not up to par. I was sitting there like, dude, the course is dope. It's huge. Have you guys seen it? <laughs> and everyone's complaining about it. I'm like, oh, okay, this is like OG Super Park stuff. You know, like, we finally got some big jumps. Let's go. All these people Those are things were fucking hogs. Dude, they were hogs. They were huge. So everyone was bummed out about it. And me and I'm laughing because I'm like, dude, this is the shit I live for. I want They them. thought it was too big. Yeah, they thought it was too big. And it was mad icy at first, which was pretty gnarly. But, um, yeah, we rolled up, rolled up into a little ball at the Olympics and just did our own thing, man. It was so cool. We just we took it all in. And just being at the Olympics was so rad. And seeing all this other amazing talent that you're around, it's impossible not to get inspired to win. You're around all these people. You're looking, you go to the cafeteria. It's all these other countries. And so you'd, you'd sit in there like, dude, all these people have worked just as hard as me to get here. But now it's like, who's going to work even harder to get that gold? You know, who's going to step up? And it became this kind of thing that I, I'd look around like, all right, dude, McMoe's going, Stolle's going, you know, like these are the dogs. Like, let's do this. And, you know, I went back to, to my goals. I was like, hey, put a rundown. I put a rundown, didn't make it directly to finals. The way that it was set up is top four made it directly to finals. And it was like, Perot, McMo, Sven, and maybe someone else. I can't remember. So I missed that, and I I 
went back in the semis like two days later and semis and finals in the same day, which I think helped me so much. Cause I, we woke up, we had practice at 8 a.m. Courses straight east facing, the sun's coming up into your eyes. People were complaining, trying to get uh, practice postponed. Like, I can't see. I'm like, dude, you guys just, like, you don't know the course by now. Like, I close my eyes and ride down this thing. So I was like, okay, take this to my advantage. And I was in flow state. I didn't fall the whole day. I was in straight flow state. Dude, I like put music in at the top. I'm like, okay, today is my day. Made it to the finals. And then you get a little little break and then another practice. I took like two runs of practice. And every it was like an hour and a half or something. Like people were taking laps. It was so gnarly. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. People going up st- stone-faced. It was it was a brawl, dude. And so I call Blaze. I'm like, dude, I need a homie to talk to, dude. This, I'm like, just a nice, it's, friendly face. It's, it's 3 a.m. in Utah. Oh, yeah, mind, dude. Mind you, so. Everyone in... Everyone in Utah is watching, getting like gooned at Stax's house or something. <laughs> like those are the day one homies. It's so all my. Like, I mean, I need to talk to these guys and get some like little, like little, little like breath of home. You know, comfort. like yeah, a little comfort. So this I is call, right before finals, mind you, right? Right before finals, do practice is over. I call Blaze. I'm like, dude, I think I'm gonna go for the same kind of run. I'm gonna go 16:20 at the bottom though. Blaze is like, what? what? Too much, right? Yeah, he's like, dude, you're 16, 20. He's like, have you ever tried that? I was like, no. I was like, but this is the time to step <laughs> up. And he was like, he got you to gold with that, huh? <laughs> he's like, he's like, okay. He was, I, I kind of back it, actually. He's like, I, I kind of like it. Just chuck it. And I'm like, well, dude, think it's a backside 12 with another 360. It's, you end up in the same rotation. I was like, dude, I got that all day. He's like, dude, chuck it. Do it. Like, you're at the Olympics. I was like, dude, I don't want to come. Big ass jump. Yeah, huge jump. I was like, I don't want to come to the Olympics and and say that I didn't try my hardest when I'm 50 years old. You know, I didn't want to be that person. Like, oh, I I would rather fall on that trick saying I gave it my all than doing a run, going back to what Bill Enos told me. He goes, don't be afraid to win. So I was like, dude, I I need to do this because this is what it takes to win. I need to, I get, all these dudes are chucking all these tricks. I need to I need to level up. And so I went in, I went into full flow state and Bill Enos gave me the best best advice ever maybe. Um he told me to take it feature by feature. He was like just black out and take it feature by feature. Drop in, hit the first rail. Don't even think don't think about the jumps until you're there. So I land I land my first two jumps. I'm coming into the last one. I go, "Oh yeah, 16." And I'm on the lip, and dude, it was the craziest thing ever. I, it wasn't, it was fully euphoric, man. It was so crazy. It wasn't like I blacked out. I didn't know what happened, but when I went up the lip, it was, it was as if this was destined to happen. It was like I got this 16 on lock. I had so much confidence going into it that I chucked it. I kind of got a little squirrely in the air, but it just came around to 16, and I laced it. I was like, oh shit, did I do a 12? I was like, I think I did a 12. And I literally went to the bottom. I was like, dude, I think I messed up and I did a 12 because that felt too easy. Wow. Score comes up. It's like high, not like 93 something, 95. And, I, and from then, that was the run that won. And I was like tripping, dude. I was freaking out because I had to watch every single buddy come one more one run. Ooh. And then I had to go down. I, got, I still got, I think I would have gotten second with my second run because I kind of hand dragged on the sixteen. But I had to I had to watch everyone come down. And, you know, from my standpoint, I kept saying, well, you know, it's all good. You know, if I even get fourth, fifth, I'm good. I put down that run. And as it got down, I was like, dude, these people, no. Like, you're not taking this from me. <laughs> I just spit everywhere. Not that trick. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was like, you ain't taking this from me, dude. And it got nail bars. People were dropping the craziest runs. Dude, spectators, same thing. Continue, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. It was like people were straight up dropping – Hammer runs, craziest runs ever. Like if you look back and watch that final, I think it was probably one of the craziest slope style contests ever. And it all it obviously came where it was like Sven should have won, Stolly should have won, Mark should have won. You know, it was like all these things. I'm like, oh dude, like this sucks. You know, I was kind of getting hit at all angles. Like you shouldn't have won. And people were like you saved snowboarding. It was so it made me so uncomfortable. You know, I was like craw- crawled up into a little ball that night. It was like, dude, this is so. It kind of got like imposter syndrome. Like. That shouldn't have happened. I can't believe this is going on, doing all these interviews and not not even knowing what was going on with my I didn't talk to my mom and dad. I didn't talk to anyone. It was so crazy. So You're twenty it, years old at this point, right? I was twenty years old. Oh, t- only twenty, huh? Yeah. 
and he got the first gold for the country which, in Russia, which Chris happens to be wearing. Yeah, for the he's listeners wearing. that can't see, I'm wearing it. You guys should have like heavy. a CeeLo game yeah. to see if you can't <laughs> win that off you or something. <laughs> You ever pawn what, it off? What music were you listening to? Um, I remember I remember exactly what I was listening to at the talk because I wouldn't listen to it on my run. I would tuck it in my bib and I was listening to LL Cool J Mama said talk you out. Wow. No, was, I knew people would so, ask that. Yeah, but. yeah. So I was going through it was like kinda just kinda shuffled. That is dude, fucking crazy, dude. That's, that's dude. the most random that is, song I could imagine. That is unbelievable. And plus that's like hype you up song no, yeah, right there. So that was, video, everything. Yeah. I was going on shuffle. I was like, I need some heat. I need some heat. And, I was like, <laughs> and you know, I was like, Mama said, knock you out. I'm going to knock you out. I was like, Bam. dude, I started going like, I'm going to knock you out. It was so good. And it just, it put me into such a good mood. I literally dropped, dropped the headphone. It was like 10 seconds and it was on, you know, it was just absolute flow state cl clicking into such a crazy state of mind, which I know me and you have talked about flow state before. Um, and what can click, what can put you into that? But I mean, just being in that kind of high stress environment and everything, that's where I thrive. You put pressure on me, like I won't come, I'm not going to say I'm going to come through every time. That's impossible, but that will make me channel into some inner, inner flow state, you know, mindset that will just take me to the next level. Instead of folding like many might. Yeah. It, fight or flight. It gets you hyped. That's fight or flight. That's Incredible. the beauty of competition. You know, as much totally. as it forces you. To be your best self. Yeah, like, it's like show up or go home. What are you doing? You got to totally. beat. Everybody has the same playing field. You got to be better than them. And you get yeah. you get a couple of wins. You get yourself some confidence. It's fucking beautiful. No, it really is. And yeah, I think that's what like contests have really taught me that throughout my whole career is that, yeah, like you, you need to be better than other people. That's mm -hmm. just, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You can't, you can't win by being cool. Like that, it's just a, it's just a different state of mind, you know. And I, I like both sides of snowboarding. Where in filming, you can, you can, you can be, you know, more relaxed and all this. But me coming from a contest state of mind, I, I a lot of times frown on that because I'm like, dude, you need you should be working your ass off every day, you know. Like that's I look to other sports and I really get I really find a lot of inspiration in in other sports besides like skating and snowboarding and surfing, you know, because. It's true drive and determination that takes those people to the next level. And, you know, I think snowboarding's biggest argument, what people are so scared of is not being cool and snowboarding and not being accepted by, you know, I, I don't want to be a jock. I don't want to be about, I don't want to be this square. But you can also, you can have all these goals and do all this stuff, but you can still at the end of the day go like party with Lick the Cat and go hang out, you know, do whatever. That's not, you working hard should be the coolest thing in snowboarding. That's a great fucking message. And, and it really is. Another thing, too, to touch on that we were talking about before off camera, but, you know, a lot of times people that are, you know, anti-jock, right? You right. know, I'm going to back it up and say I grew, I grew up playing um, conventional sports, hockey, soccer, baseball, all the shit, right? And, and in those sports, they teach you how to lose. Mm -hmm. They teach you team. They teach you, you know, if I get an assist, it's as good as, as a goal. I'm going to help my buddy out. And those, those are all important things where sometimes you see in snowboarding the people that only played individual sports their whole life or, you know, it, it's about themselves. So if they don't get a trick, you know, they don't, they don't know how to lose and they, and they put it on everybody else in the crew. Right. And sometimes the people that are anti-jock that never played sports, to me, they're the biggest jocks because when they <laughs> fucking, they don't know how to lose. <laughs> Dude, and they're like so competitive. And they look bad, they, huh? They don't, they don't know how to They react it. bad. They react bad and they don't know how to be competitive and have fun. They're right. competitive and like, they don't, they can't, like I can be competitive and fuck around with you. Some people are like, it like eats them away. And that's totally. kind of cool about contests. You have to learn how to lose, right? Dude, you you need to learn so yeah you learn a lot of valuable life lessons competing or or just doing team sports and yeah I guess that was always my thing too like I put you know I played I played sports when I was a kid and I actually really liked them I just chose snowboarding I just thought was so much more fun and and you know you do get the freedom aspect it is really rad but yeah I think competing can really teach you yeah you know you need to know how to lose you need to you need to learn how to how to move on from situations. You know, I'd, I'd always tell myself, you know, if I did really bad at a contest, I would give my, I would give myself 24 hours from that point. I'd say, okay, don't soak on it, but I need to like watch footage. What went wrong? You know, kind of work through that and in a problematic way, just kind of say, okay, what went wrong? What went right? What can I do to move on to the next event that I can put what I learned here and miss like messed up on and do better at the next event? And that was how I'd always, I would kind of, if when you're getting a groove of doing good, you kind of keep it going. 
But when, when you do bad, people will go down these really bad streaks because they get so hard on themselves. They won't, they don't know how to work past that. And it happens in filming too. You can see it. People have a bad day filming. It resonates into the next day because they're bringing that bad energy and the mistakes that they did yesterday into that new day. We're like, Oh, I don't even want to hit that spot. Dude. I'm like over it. Dude, it's like, what? it's a new day. Interest, it's a, basically. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's a very good bad that's a, day, bad trip. Yeah. Then you look back and like, do that trip really sucked. And, Dude, that's a lear- that's a really good learning experience of what to not do next time. But I think it's pretty I think it's pretty good to look at stuff that way and I think that's where people are so scared to look at it in a way where like I really do look at every day as a way to win, but not in a way that you're beating everyone else. But like you can come out winning every day if you have the right attitude and the right mental um mental attitude towards everything, then yeah, you can't literally beat everyone every day, but you could say, man, today was really rough, but you can, that still, you can still win from that. Like, okay, I need to take what happened today. Why, you know, what is going on? Like, I need to address this. I need to move on. I need to, I need to really look at myself, what happened and, and move forward, you know? And it's really, it's so easy to say it's really hard to do. It's one of those things that you really need, you know, you need friends, you need other people that are on the same mindset as you. And I think that's why I think, and snowboarding is so easy for people to be caught up in negativity because so many people, there's so much animosity in snowboarding. It's not even necessarily hate, but it's, you know, there's a lot of animosity towards people that are doing good or have something that you don't. But at the end of the day, those people might just sort of be working harder than you. And that's like hard to deal with because if you go on those trips and you're, you're drinking and you're just doing this and that and the other person's working really hard and getting these shots. I mean, man, at the end of the day, like hard work, man, it just goes back to that. And I've been on both sides. I've been on trips where like, dude, just kind of like pile out, not do much. And I look back like, dude, I just wasted that trip. That was so stupid, you know? And you could really look at, if you have a positive group of friends around you that can bring you up instead of bringing you down, that's the people that are be your homies for the rest of your life. And those are the people you should really count on to be next to you. And those are the people that you should try to go on trips with or, or just be with in any walk of life, whether it's snowboarding or in school or anything like try to find those people that, that lift you up and not bring you down. Dude, you should be a motivational I'm speaker. I'm fired up, dude. I am fucking. Let's get go the, do some let's shit. Go. Anything. Get the Tony I'll, Robbins. I'll do anything right let's now. start a podcast. Get, get, <laughs> fuck it. Let's do it. Get that Tony Robbins headset on and get dude, in front of some people. You, you talk about the animosity, and it's interesting. It's like when people started doing big jib shit, and all these people are like, that's whack. Mm-hmm. It's totally. Like, you're saying that's whack because you don't even want to go do yeah. that, man. Yeah, you're looking that at ain't whack. Dude, yeah, because you can look at someone like Dan Breeze and say, oh, dude, he's used to winch into this and that. Yeah, it's okay. It's, you're going back to it's not very cool or what not but dude that stuff is so gnarly and that there's a niche for everything in snowboarding whether you think it's cool or not you're looking at people especially on instagram and youtube and stuff now it has its ups and downs 100 percent. but when you post in those clips people really get stoked on that stuff man they really get hyped on on it they'll get hyped on a smaller thing too like there's there's a there's an avenue for everyone in, in yeah. snowboarding and in, in a lot of other walks of life that it doesn't need to be so narrow-minded you know yeah. And I think in snowboarding is in any sport, it really, or any action sport really kind of hard to deal with that because, you know, there is the coolness factor, there's a style and, and people think snowboard should be going one way, but that's something that I've seen firsthand from after the Olympics is that going to the Olympics, I thought, I straight up thought the Olympics was so whack. I almost, I almost, um, when I was in Colorado at one of the events, it got canceled and then it came out, Bob Costas said, he said something of the, of the he said uh, what did he say? I'm going to butcher it probably. He just basically said that snowboarding really isn't an Olympic sport. And I was like, dude, come on, man. We're working our ass over here. We're like, we're, we are an Olympic sport. And it, it got me pissed off on the other side because I was ready to, I was ready to leave. I honestly didn't want to go to the Olympics because I thought it was so lame and the qualification process was whack. How the team was selected isn't the, you know, all the best people aren't really there. It's a couple people from every country you know, X games is really kind of the top tier. And so that lit a fire under my ass. It got, it did went full MJ got personal. I was like, you know what? It went back to when I was a kid. Like, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. And it actually got to the point where Todd Richard gave me a, a snowboard pin from the Olympics. Everyone clicks pins there, you know? 
And he was like, yeah, dude, like give this to Bob Costas if you do an interview with him. And I straight up, before we went on on air with NBC with Bob Costas, I straight up looked at him and go, I know you're not snowboarding's biggest fan, so I got you to snowboard. <laughs> <laughs> and he fully backpedaled. I'm so sorry. I didn't really mean that, this and that. I really think what you guys do is really rad. I'm like, dude, whatever. You're talk, talking shit, get hit. And then what, what, ha- what happened? Mama on said Jim, knock on, you out. On Jimmy Kimmel, what happened? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jimmy, yeah and on Jimmy Fallon, um, I, Jimmy Fallon, I, I went on and we did this, we did this really funny skit on there. Um, mm-hmm. and then at, backstage afterward, you signed this book and it's, you know, it's a pretty dope book. Everyone's on there, you know? And, um, I wrote in like, thanks for having me on all this other stuff. Signed Sage Kotzenberg. And I go, PS, <laughs> or I said, <laughs> I said, PS, the guy who gave, uh, Bob cost his pink eye. <laughs> Cause we <laughs> talked about it on there. We were laughing so hard, you know, I was, I was on NBC. I'm looking at him like, dude, you got pink eye right now. <laughs> He's got poo particles in his yeah. eye. <laughs> OBJ stuff. So good. Is so Fallon good. cool or what? Dude, Fallon was so cool. That whole media tour was so rad after the Olympics. It was such a trip because basically after the Olympics, Sean was Sean White was slated to win pipe, right? And when he I was already they I did two or three days in Sochi from do like 8 a.m. to 3 a.m. every day for like three days. It was so gnarly. Just media. Media. Jeez. Dude, they treat you well, though. It's it's like, I mean, I'll gladly, <laughs> gladly do it again. But it was so draining. And then they're, they're just pretty much like, you need to go to New York right now. Every single talk show wants you on. I'm like, whoa. Because you're in this little Olympic bubble there. And you're like, oh, we're going back to like, this is it. It's happening. And that's when it kind of really hit. It's like, hey, I won the Olympics. This is so insane. <laughs> and so I get on this flight back. And dude, I couldn't walk through like, the, I couldn't walk through the airport or anything. I was so low because I was going back to meet up with, you know, my, my agent and this PR lady, Stephanie Rodnick. She's amazing. She made everything so dope. Uh, major shouts to her. But um, I get to New York and it was, and it was, the day I got there, like Sean got, you know, fourth or fifth in pipe. And so the phone started going off the hook because they, they everyone had day. him like booked pretty much to win and come back. So I just got his leftovers. <laughs> I was like, dude, I was on it. It was crazy. I'd wake up at like 5 a.m. in New York and I would literally have, I would have a call every 15, 20 minutes until 8 p.m. And, and in between going to the talk shows, I'd go to the morning show and in the green room, I would have two or three interviews then I would do the I would do the talk show, and then I'd get into the back room. Two, three more interviews on the way to breakfast. Then it was like, okay, two or three more interviews on the way to another talk show, or like go to BuzzFeed or this and that. It was so hectic. But um, the PR lady Stephanie was, dude, it was so gnarly. It was full. It was Wild. something I've never seen. It was just like a list. This it was like all time slotted and everything. Like this is what you're doing today. It was so crazy. How come yours seems so much more, many more interviews than maybe Red or something? I think it was because of the Sean White factor. Yeah. Like he didn't, yeah, he didn't win. And so I, I basically just got booked for everything. You were the dog. I was the dog. <laughs> yeah. So it was crazy. I do is to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't walk around New York and it was just bombarded with people, restaurants, anywhere I went, people would like, start chanting USA in really? places. It was crazy, man. Overnight, Something, too. That's overnight. Not, that's not like like a celebrity status. That's overnight. Overnight, yeah. So I was, I definitely was like a little shell-shocked, but I'm such, I love talking, I love talking to people and hearing about everyone. So that was bringing us back to, you know, snowboarding. And I thought, how cool is this opportunity for me to spread how rad snowboarding can be and how how cool our sport that we do at the Olympics really, really affects people. They really like it. And so I actually, I was doing so much media for weeks that I got invited to the Oscars. And I, at that time, I was like, dude, the Oscars? I was like, I don't even know if that's the music one or the movie one. <laughs> I didn't really know. I didn't care at the time. And I said, I was like, nah, I don't want to go to the Oscars. I told my agent, Jeez. Steve, Rob, I was like, I don't want to go to the Oscars. I'm going to go on a pal trip with uh, Haldor and Ethan Morgan in Switzerland. Respect. <laughs> yeah. Which was, it was awesome. We had the, we had the best time, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was cool. And I, I went over, it was the first time really riding again. And I was seeing these people over in Europe. Cause at that point it was like op- open or the closing ceremonies of the Olympics for maybe a week or two before. So people were still hyped on the Olympics and I would be in the, I'd be in the airport in Europe or on the slopes or something. And, People were coming up and literally saying, we watched the Olympics. We're all snow. This is our first day riding or this is our first, our kid watching the Olympics. And we bought him a setup. This is the, you know, we're so stoked. We can't believe we met you. We can't, why are you in Europe? You know? And it was so cool. You saw firsthand what, what you can really do from, from something like an Olympics and bring 
so much stoke and, and hype to, to the industry that we all, that brought us up, like you're now feeding back into that, you know? And I thought that was so cool because when I was a kid, I really loved, do I have signed posters of Jones, UC Oxenden, Eddie Wall, all dude, everyone, Ross Powers, Sean White. I have like photos of Sean White when we were, when me and Blaze were eight at Park City, you know, <laughs> like I, we were such big snowboard fans that I just really wanted to give that energy that I felt back to the kids now. And I was in the position to do so. So I just wanted to make sure that everything I did, snowboarding looked good, you know, and like we, you know, we as an industry looked welcoming and inclusive and not exclusive, which is so easy for people to do. They, they go off and contest, contest or whack. Oh, like this is the cool thing to do. You shouldn't do that. Don't wear that. It's lame, you know? And, you know, to an extent, there's some things that there needs to be guidelines on what's, you know, what's cool and what's not for, for, you know, for all of our sakes, you know, but at a certain point I do, let's get these people into snowboarding first and then you deal with that. Then you feed them all the cool stuff, you know, mm -hmm. but you need to welcome them in first. You don't want to, you know, there's, you own a snowboard or skate shop. Sometimes you just get straight vibed out and like, dude, I don't want to, like, I don't want to even buy a board anymore, you know? And I feel like that's, that's kind of an issue where, um, I think nowadays it's a lot, it's a lot more welcoming, you know? But I just wanted to give that energy out. Like, you wel welcome to snowboarding. You know, I come on in. It's the water's warm. <laughs> great, great fucking great spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, before we you. fully move on from uh, the Olympics, we have a guest question. Guest Clint. question is presented by Solomon. Clint. If you're looking for a unisex all mountain board, get yourself the dance hall. I see Harrison Gordon, Desiree Melanson, Nils Mindick, aka Mud Dick, killing it <laughs> on that board. But without further ado, let's get into the guest question from Ben Ferguson. Wow. What up, Bombhole? Ben Ferg here. Heard you got Sage Kotzenberg on the show today. Got a question for the guy. Um, based off of my experience hanging out with you, you're kind of a workhorse, Sage. Very motivated guy. Um, always hustling, it seems like to me. Um, so I remember a recent conversation we had about a technique called sperm retention. I'm wondering if you've been implementing that into your, you know, daily regimen this fall. And uh, if you think that's a beneficial or detrimental technique for a young snowboarder on the come up. Thanks. Interested to hear your answer. <laughs> great great question. <laughs> oh, my, dude, that's so funny. I sperm forgot. Retention. I forget how we got on that, on that conversation. We started talking about sperm retention and uh, how it makes you kind of like, I don't know, I think like boxers and fighters can do it. But I, I went opposite of the, the night before the Olympics went full release. Full yeah, release. Full release. So, so I don't know. I mean, I go, you know, maybe they both work. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they're both detrimental. Not morning <laughs> of, but full yeah, night, before. night before. Yeah, full release. Well, a lot of coaches, you know, grew up playing hockey, all these sports, they tell you. Don't. Don't jack off. Yeah. Before, you know, I don't know if there's female women listening, like they don't, might not know this is a thing, but a lot of coaches will be like, hey, don't jerk off. We got a big game tomorrow, right? Well, Sage jerked off the night before the Olympics. He fucking won the Olympics. Or have yeah. sex. We could say <laughs> or have yeah. sex. Uh, or you do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. It's not yeah. on me. <laughs> yeah. True. Well, I mean, we're talking about 16-year-old kids playing football. Yeah. So. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. or this guy yeah. being in Russia in yeah. some weird little room. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine the... Can you paint a picture of what it was like? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of uh, what kind of genres are we talking about? <laughs> you going POV? Are you using, yeah, what, what are you using a GoPro? What are you going on? <laughs> can we do a GoPro plug right there? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I got, I mean, sperm retention, that's a real thing. I think, yeah. uh, I think, uh, it's necessary sometimes, but also sometimes you need that release. Rambo, you guys are big Ram on the release Ram where you love a good release. <laughs> yeah, good release. I've heard. Yeah. So Rambo season seems like you're going to want to implement sperm retention. To I think me. there was True. a bit of retention going on in Rambo season. What about for Ch sure. Chad's gap seems like a sperm retention. Kind yes. Of. Yeah. Chad's True. gap. Maybe. Chad's gap. You want all, you need that you need bowl. That weight. Energy. You need whatever <laughs> extra weight to clear the gap. <laughs> yeah, straight up. A couple of ounces could totally. It could. It could throw you over the edge. Right. You want like minor. <laughs> Elephantitis of the yes. ball sack region, essentially. Like, you go as long as you can, I heard. Anyways. You know. might you might go, you might uh, might land and then go full release. <laughs> well, you, that's never happened. Well, you know what Maybe. happens? If you don't, if you don't release It'll release. Time, auto you have a release. Nocturn, nocturnal emission. Yeah. Had one of those <laughs> the other green. night. Yeah. Just Did kidding. you really? Last night. No, <laughs> is that real? Oh. No, Thinking I, about I, this podcast. What actually. do you mean? Is a, it happens. I've tried it's to natural. implement sperm retention before, and I've had a nocturnal emission. So wow. Yeah. It yeah, happens. That, no, it'll happen. That will happen. That's um, a natty release. That's a, that is that's what a we call natty release. That's a natty release. Or a sneaky Pete at night, too. Yeah. It reaps up on you. The Chad's gap, though, it's like you almost want to be like 
borderline fighting your friends on the way there. You're <laughs> so pent up. True. For <laughs> sure. Like, you want to be like bo- like default mode aggressive. Yeah, basically. yeah. Flip the switch. Literally, just bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> you got to, dude. That thing is Thanks. make or uh, break. Yeah, yeah it is. You've seen you've <laughs> yeah. seen what happens when you knuckle it. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Not good. Not mm-hmm. good. So I got a Patreon question from uh, Rob Z. And he says, I saw a rad interview with you at the Olympics, and he talked about how chewing gum chilled you out while riding and competing. Do you still chew gum when you shred? I know it's random, but I thought your theory behind it was rad, the theory that if you trick your body into thinking you're eating, it makes you relax. Is, this, is that all <laughs> true? Did you say that? In I probably or? did. I don't know. I used to chew I used to chew gum at every event almost, and I, I, would, I was extra polar ice was the one. And so at the Olympics, I was chewing it, and then I remember – I can't remember if it was in my run in the finals or semis or something, but I spit it out the bottom. I was just so high to land on my run, and I just got clowned on on, on Twitter and stuff, dude. On Twitter? Yeah, Twitter hit me hard. It's like, how disrespectful the snowboarder spit out his gun. Like, dude, the MLB guys are like packing dip, spitting on the mound. You're going to clown on me for spitting gum? I'm sorry. <laughs> like, but yeah, I used to use it. I would, I don't know, I just... It would kind of be distracting for sure, and I don't know. I just use that, and actually, after the Olympics, Polar Ice sent me a huge ice chest of it was like two, three years worth of gum. It was unreal. Sick. Yeah, and I got dapped up hard. It was so sick. Dude, you look at NBA players like Ray Allen's out there just draining tray bombs, chomping on some gum. Yeah, all day long. that thing's like, tacky by the end. Going so going back to kind of exiting the Olympics, did you have kind of a identity crisis because you're like normally you're this normal border all of a sudden you're just this overnight success you're larger than life you won the olympics is there kind of an identity of crisis associated with that yeah totally i i kind of said it before you know i was definitely after the olympics got a little bit of imposter syndrome of who i who i was what i represented you know i didn't i, I straight up lost my snowboard identity it was so weird i don't know other how any other way to put it would be but yeah i kind of got there's, there's kind of this thing called it, like it's called Olympic depression or it might have a different name, but it's just, you reach this peak and then it, you go into that overnight success. And for me, it was so crazy with like saying like Sean, Sean didn't do good. And I went into this kind of different realm and it was so, it was so heavy for a bit that you kind of get used to it. And that's why I had to bail on like going to the Oscars and this, that like, dude, I don't even want to get sucked down this path because it's, it's kind of it's just a dangerous place to walk, you know, because you get so hooked on that that you want that so much, but that has nothing to do with like what you're what you're still doing in snowboarding. Snowboarding isn't that. It's not you know, it's not Hollywood. It's not this and that, except for the Olympics. And so I kind of just like crawled into a hole. I just didn't really know where I fit in in snowboarding because people were straight up. It was so it was so weird, and I got so uncomfortable. People literally were saying, and people that I really love and respect, you know, were saying, you know, you saved snowboarding. I'm sitting there like, from what, man? Like, I don't even, I'm, don't, stop saying that because it's making me so uncomfortable because I, I I went there, I did my run, ended up working out, it was really rad, and all this stuff happened, but now you got me on this, you're putting me on this weird pedestal that I need to keep this going, so I went in this weird state of mind where I really wanted to start filming because that was my whole, that was my whole thought process was go to the Olympics and whatever happens, Ne- never compete again and start filming. That was my, I told the U S team that told my mom and dad, all my, I told my sponsors. And so after the Olympics, I won and I was like, well, I guess I'll just give it another year. And do, I started just doing terrible and contests that show up, not care about practice, not do my runs, fall on my runs and literally leave just so bummed out. And I, it f- affected me later than in the moment. And cause it, uh, it wasn't such a big deal in the moment, I just, I don't know, but it, it really affected me later, you know, a couple of years after where I felt like I hadn't done anything since the Olympics. And it was hard. I, I felt, I just felt pressure from like sponsors and people of looking and, you know, I'd see comments like, wow, like, like what have you been doing since the Olympics? I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? I've been shredding my ass off, but it really wasn't up to the level where I really could be. And that really affected me. So I definitely got pretty bummed out and I needed to readjust of what, what I really wanted to see out of my career and snowboarding and whatnot. Really had to put a pretty deep thought process into what I wanted next. You know, like where did I want to end up? And so that's when I started pretty much. I, I went to my sponsors who are so awesome. You know, I was, I was just about to get on Oakley and they were like, they were about to sign me. I had monster forever and, and GoPro as well and stuff. And, I went to them in person and I 
in one day, I was, I was like, dude, I'm never competing again. I'm, I'm over it. And all of them met me with, we're so hyped you're saying that. Where, where are we going to take it? What do you want to do? Let's go. Let's bring you back. You know, like, let's, let's get behind you. And it was so rad seeing that from these big sponsors where I'm saying, I'm not feeling good about this. Like, I need, uh, if you want to support me, cool. If not, like, I straight up was like, drop me now because I can't, I can't go down that route anymore. It was really affecting me. And they all got behind my back. And even Oakley, who was just signing me, said, we don't really want you to go do that. We're, let's take it to this next level in a different realm. You want to go backcountry? Let's do this. Let's put the resources we need behind you to go do this, you know? And I felt like I was back, you know? And so that that really put me into, you know, wanting to... Because I really looked up to dudes like Travis Rice and, and Gigi and all them. And they they used to compete. And, and Pat Moore, too, you know? Like, those guys really competed. And then they went and filmed, you know? That's kind of if there is one blueprint in snowboarding, that's kind of a way to do it. It's like you compete, you compete, and then you, you leave that and you have this whole other realm of filming, you know, which is really rad that it's like that in snowboarding because a lot of sports don't have that. And so I basically told everyone I didn't want to compete anymore and they were all behind me and I started saying, okay, well, I, cause I, I just felt like I was being so mediocre for years and it was so, it sucked because I knew I was a top rider and I just wasn't, I, I had lost all that drive. All of that ambition was gone. And that, that was just something I didn't know how to work for. I didn't, I couldn't talk to anyone about it. Cause it just sounded, it sounded dumb to me. So I didn't want to bring it up to anyone else of like, Hey man, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of bummed out on like where I'm at and writing and everything. It's affecting like my, my health, my mental health and everything. And as soon as I started opening up, I'm like, dude, I need to, I need to do something else. That was, basically opened up the floodgates to backcountry riding and I, you know, taking all the necessary steps to get there. You know, it's, it's hard to switch over to that because you need to, you know, you need to take avalanche courses and you need to know snow science. You need to get your first aid going. You need to, you need to know how to study we- like weather patterns. You know, you don't need to know everything about it. You need to, you need to know where to go. And then, you know, it's like, okay, we go to Europe. Where do you go? You want to go to, you know, interior BC, like what sled lot do you go to? You know, you don't know any of that stuff. So I kind of looked at that. I was like, whoa, okay. I can't just do this mediocre. This is my thing. So I went into this, again, one of this kind of crazy state of mind. And I was like, I need to become the best backcountry rider that, you know, one of the best to do it. You know, that was my, that's like my goal still, you know, it's still going on. And it was a couple year process to win, like last year winning rider of the year and everything. And I really needed, so I needed like help from so many people that in contests, I you can kind of get away without that. You know, you can kind of, sh- your writing really does the talking in contests. What in his backcountry, you have no idea to where to even go. Like, where are those jumps at? You know, when you watch those videos, I don't know where they are. You know, I don't know where they are. Where's that pillow stack? You know, and, and you need to land it in a couple of tries. It's really difficult to plug into that. But once you do, it's, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Going back, uh, I remember the a shift in from my perspective, seeing the change. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was the summer you were going into New Zealand? I remember like you and Zach had both just broke up with your girlfriends. You guys, <laughs> we both signed an NDA and just <laughs> you, you guys both, yeah, and you guys both just like went fucking dummy we went dummy and, and you did the back 10 revert and you guys were partying and you were yeah. doing cinder season and you're bringing that energy to the mountain and that seemed like to me from my perspective because i remember before that seeing you at the fenway big air uh, right. in boston and that seemed like where you were kind of in that lost phase. that was my last event i ever did yeah. i got a concussion Dude, there yeah i remember you got a concussion yeah. you just were, didn't want to be there it sucked. and um and then you see that that shift to me was the uh, was new zealand with the back 10 bring back <laughs> totally that was and like that's that's where i kind of went back to you know, I, I still, to this day, I feel like a little kid again. I'm so excited for every winter. I have all these new goals and everything I want to do, <clears throat> but that wasn't always the case. You know, I had to like, I had to dig deep to find that again. You know, like, where was that? Where was that stoke? Where was that ambition at? And you, <clears throat> pardon me, you really need to look at into yourself and deal kind of what we were talking about. You really need to look at yourself and deal with where you're at and like what has happened and move forward. And that was something I just kind of put off for a couple of years. Like, yeah, I'm a pro star. Do I won the Olympics? You know, all good. I, I'm just cruising, you know, like I want to be, 
I want to be the chill guy or, you know, whatever. I was like in this weird state of mind. I'm like, dude, I'm not the chill guy. I'm a dude that's going no matter what. I don't care. I'm going hard, whether it's on the mountain, off the mountain. You know, I just, I'm like that. I'm a go getter. And so that really put it in. I was like, okay, cinder season, you know, that, that watching that Cardiello interview was like, dude, let's go. Let's change this up. I'm not, I'm not a mediocre writer. I'm one, you know, I, was, I started telling myself I'm one of the best. Like I won the Olympics. I started kind of owning it. And because bef- after the Olympics, like I said, I was so uncomfortable. I didn't want to, I didn't even want to own it. I didn't want to own any of the X Games medals or anything. I was just like, dude, that was, I don't know. That wasn't, that was not me anymore. And that's just where I was. And then as soon as I started owning that stuff, I'm like, dude, I am, I am better than this for sure. And I need to dig deep to find that. And it was being around, you know, Zach was in the same spot. He got, you know, dropped from Burton and everything. He was saying that on here. And he needed that fire too. We linked up. He's like, okay, hey, let's go hard. Let's do this. Let's let's not let down until we get what we want. It sounds like you were mentally checked out at those contests, right? So it's, you're just kind of going through the motions, but your head yeah, wasn't in the game. Which is so easy to do at events. I think a lot of people don't really see, like, do you show up and it's like, I mean, dude, we, on Nike, dude, it's like, you show up, dude, you're in like a $10 million house, there's a mas- like a masseuse there, like a PT, whatever, eating good food, there's a chef, <laughs> dude, you're living <laughs> the nice. life, no, I'll mentally check out for sure, <laughs> yeah. what kind enjoy of, what that, kind of bisque go we talking, emotions. what kind yeah. of bisque, let's get into the bisque, bisque. Yeah. bisque, yeah, I mean, there is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the day of the Olympics was, I mean, the, I had pretty good incentives from the day of the Olympics, it was definitely like six figures the day of the Olympics, like, walking away, like, Totally didn't even realize till that like, day. Yeah, till days after. It's like, oh yeah, I have like crazy incentives that we put in that I definitely never thought I would get. <laughs> they probably never thought I'd get either. But there was a funny one. Was the Nike goggle one? Was that Nike really wanted me on their goggles all winter? And I was, I was. Arnett was kind of. It was kind of stopped, and it was kind of weird. And then I didn't want to ride the Nike goggles right away. I was like, dude, I just Nike. I, I just didn't. Tr- I almost like didn't trust them. And it was a gut feeling. I was like, dude, I feel like I just, I just didn't know about it. And so the day of the Olympics, I remember like uh, John Weaver, who's such a good dude. He's taught me so much. Uh, you know, he was definitely one that put in my brain that as good as you are at snowboarding everything, you know, you need to be on it with yeah your social media and this and that, which I think people still argue with is so weird to me of, of social media. It's like, you know, this, this is a part of snowboarding now. And, you know, he was one that really taught me to just, like embrace is like, dude, this is your job at the end of the day, like go have fun and stuff. But you know, at the end of the day, why is it, why is a brand going to pay you to snowboard? You know, you need to give them something in return. Nike's no dude, no joke. You go to the campus and they're talking, you know, it's, it's Shit's real. Shit is real, dude. And you get that, you got to get a little pressure for sure. But it taught me to, you know, like what does a brand want for me for snowboarding? And you know, it was, it, he just taught me a lot about that and he's a really good dude. But so him and my, him, he was the TM or even maybe above the TM at that point at Nike and he was at the Olympics and he had the goggles with him. He was like, telling, <laughs> telling rough, my, he's like, tell him to put on the goggles. They like, there was like a 50 G deal to like, dude, put on the goggles. I would put I, the goggles on. I didn't wear them in my run. Oh no. I still was like, nah, dude, I'm good. For and, then 50K? I, and then I put them on at the end. I was like, I'll put them on at the end. Like and, after you won down at the bottom? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all the photos <laughs> at the bottom of these Nike goggles and, but they were everywhere, dude. Like that's where you see it. I was like, dude, I just, I want to ride in the goggles I'm comfortable with. It was a full STE check for me. Did like, they dude, give you the 50K for winning yeah, yeah, at the bottom? It, was, it all worked out. It was pretty dope. Dude, that's fun. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a full, like, bed, just, like, put them in the goggles. Put them. I was like, no, dude, I'm not doing it. Like, I want to ride my goggles that I'm comfortable with. They're like, 50K on the line. Like, I don't care right now. I'll put them on the bottom. I don't, dude, I was like, I didn't want to be in my setup, you know? This Wheaties box, what kind of cheddar bisque we talking there? Or is that just dude, like we, a... Yeah, no, the Wheaties box got some bisque for sure. It it's, like a, it's like a lump sum at first. I was like, it was under, it was under six figures, but still very good um like you know pretty high up there but then if you like if you went to all the events we had it worked out in the contract you get like 15 g's to show up at any other event dude i would go to, i'd go to every event they asked me to go to <laughs> what's I would a wheaties go, event like i don't know the general Signing? mills you know uh, like yeah you general go, mill, you're at a mall or something yeah or? like they'd they'd hold these big events they're such a giant company you yeah. know dude i'd go to you know rough with me hey do you want to go to texas tomorrow I'm like, yeah yes, put, me on the, put me on the plane <laughs> I'll go so to Texas. Good. I'll go to. I'll go everywhere, dude. So I'll go on the General Mills tour. <laughs> hey, what uh, about Loctite? Yeah, Ooh. dude. What? We gotta talk. I use uh, Loctite. One quick question on Wheaties, <laughs> and we don't have to put this in. Are you in a trampoline? 
No, no, no. That's they, real. Yeah, yeah, that's real. <laughs> that's real. So they <laughs> just they, the way it's shot, like you know what I mean? It's it so looks crazy. so staged, right? It does. The Wheaties box looks so staged. So how that works? So does Larry, though. You know. Whatever. For the oh, listeners yeah. that can't see, I have a Larry Bird Wheaties box, and I also have a Sage Kotzenberg. Those are my two Wheaties boxes. So. Larry Bird's is the family size. Yeah, yeah. family size. <laughs> He's a little taller. I don't the know. Holy That's... Crail is dope, though. Yeah. So, you talk, did the photographer get paid? Yeah, Ma- it was Mathis. Damn, I think you gotta Mathis. Get, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. I think I know how much he got now that he told me about oh, this. Oh, yeah, yeah, sick. Yeah, good it, was, it was a good amount. Yeah, good. Yeah, it was worth it. Worth so they time. really wanted the Holy Crail to be on it. I'm like, dude, well, the only the only way to do that trick was with the cab 12 because you do cab 12 wing and you pull it back and you're, and you're kind of already in this weird situation in the air. You're in this pretzel anyway. So you just kind of reach your back hand over and grab the nose. We really want that. And, you know, we went to Park City. I'm like, dude, I'm not doing a cab 12. It was On a so, small jump, dude, right? small jump. It was, you know, cloudy out. And so I was doing these back ones with it, which was so awkward. It just didn't didn't really work, you know? And so that's that's definitely why it looks like it's off a trampoline. <laughs> I kind of wish we would that. No, no, it's good because I, I feel like more people it's are probably wondering that. we discussed this then. Yeah. All right, and then he asked about Loctite. Sorry yeah. for interrupting. Do the Loctite. If you guys got to dig up that commercial or something. So oh, we'll wor- find it. I probably, it. We'll probably find the it. worst snowboard commercial that I've ever I never out. heard of it. Yeah, going back to it. cool or not, like that. that's my cool factor went down so hard on the Loctite. Core score. <laughs> core score was <laughs> negative on the Loctite. Also, kind of dope, though. Like, Loctite's sick. I use Loctite I all the time. My dirt bike is like, I got a whole bunch of parts locked. Dude, all these, yeah. every snowboard screw's dip pre-dipped. Oh, yeah, they yeah, pre-dipped. That's, that's some serious yeah. shit. No, what was, was so big. whack about the commercial? It, dude, I don't know. You, you guys, guys kind of, we'll queue it up. We'll get in the just, show notes, or we'll show dude, it right now, Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, put it now, or definitely put it in the show <laughs> notes. It's so bad that it's funny now, you know? I'm like, I'm Sage Cosberg. Like, one thing you can trust is night <laughs> <laughs> under my names. But dude, it was like six figures, two year deal. Like For was, Loctite. Yeah, I was 18. I would have done uh, all oh, these dude, things times think, whatever came up. That's where I was always at with, you know, and, and that's where it always lo- <laughs> lied for me with, you know, there is a, you know, Money isn't everything, you know, for me at all. But at a now certain that point, you have a ton, <laughs> <laughs> now that really the lock, easy to now say. that the log tie. But at the time, I was like, dude, I'm, I want. There's a monetary value for the writing you do, and yeah, like those are the things I was looking. I was like, dude, I feel like I'm not. Gonna, I'm gonna regret this if I don't, if I don't take it. You Every, know, yeah, take and advantage. Then, you earned it. Well, it, was, it also taught me things that you know. It was like it was like the Apo deal. The Apo deal. They approached me and they really wanted to build, they did want to, it was all good intention from the start. They really wanted to build this, build this brand up and, you know, cause it was apocalypse back in the day. Oh, I never made that connection. No, I, yeah, so they, it, so f- I don't know if it was French to begin with or what, but French owners had it and they, you know, they approached me, they signed me, Spencer O'Brien and Aero and Emila. And it was all good intention from the start. I was like, let's, let's grow this team. Let's work on the product and everything. And so I, the first thing I was like, do we need to work on, I don't know, so much stuff, but it's kind of like after I signed, none of that really happened. And I, I kind of realized that mistake that I kind of made. And it was all good. I look back and that's a learning experience. For what me was the mistake? Of just, you know, kind of taking something for some money that maybe you were listening to their mm. to their words, you know, trying to make trying to do justice for it. Like, okay, it's all good. We're gonna make something cool out of this. When in the end you kind of knew maybe it wasn't gonna be like that. But all those things you can learn from them. You don't need to you know, if I wouldn't have taken that deal too, I wouldn't have learned from it in the future because after the Olympics, do I said no to, I said no to so many deals and one-off things that I just didn't believe in. I didn't want to do. And, and it was because of those choices I made with like a lock tight or this and that. I was like, these are things I can learn from and I don't regret them at all. Cause yeah, it's, especially with like a lock tight, there's a lot of cheddar biz happening, you know? Um, but also those are good learning experiences because you know where you can draw your own line of what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Because after the Olympics, dude, people were hitting me up for crazy things, things that I was I did not back at all, you know. And like an example for us. Well, I mean, there I don't know. There was like weird pyr- pyramid scheme and drink <laughs> people coming like motivate. for psycho, yeah. kind of yeah, but like for psycho money, dude, like psycho, psycho money, dude. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm, I'm looking at like, it's, when it's in front of you, it's so crazy. But in the end, I was like, I know I will regret this. And I didn't want it. It's like those things really taught me, you know, you got to look at those, you know. and just Chris take always it. says you got to know when to say no and embrace saying no. And totally. The time. And, and yeah, just looking at everything as a learning experience, I think really helps. Because, dude, you're getting tossed these, 
these deals and people will give you so much shit for like, oh, you sold out. Dude, 18. Yeah. I don't like, I don't know everything, you know, or even 19 or 20, the 20 at the Olympics. And your agent's like, no, let's do this. Yeah. Come on. Well, Ruff was always, Ruff, my agent was always really cool about stuff because he knew, he knew I had, you know, I would say no to a lot of stuff anyways. Great and trait. That is a great trait. Yeah. yeah. But I'd also, you know, I'd say yes. And, you know, at every time he'd walk me through, he goes, this is what it's like. This is definitely not cool or this and that, but they're, do you want to do it? And are you going to be happy afterwards? Mm. He would always walk me through that. And it was something so cool. Cause he wasn't like the person like, do you need to sign this thing? It's do money. This, do this, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so me and him d developed a very good bond. Like I've been with him for 10 years and we have a, such a good bond now. And you know, now everything like I'm, I'm plant-based now for the last three and a half years. I've had so many people come up, dude, like people will offer like 10, 15 grand to post this and that. I'm, I'm like, Hey, actually I, I used like I meat don't stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I, mean, I just don't. I don't. I don't eat that. I don't back it. So I'm like, well, just send, send it to someone else or whatever because that's cool. I just I don't want to do that, you know. And he knows that. He knows I have those things that I that I do care about, and you know, some some things I'm a little bit more lenient on, and some things I'm not. So you just got to take everything with a grain of salt and and learn from it. And um, yeah, the bisque is always nice, but there are you know. The, with BIS comes responsibilities too, and and <laughs> regret up. quotes. And so, yeah, up. <laughs> with, with BIS comes with great BIS and sometimes remorse comes too, great you know? a, People don't realize that they see somebody with the big contract, they don't realize the set Pressures. of expectations. There's expectations totally. that come along with fat contracts. They're like, oh, this guy makes that much money. I want this. I want that. Well, dude, they're, the reason why they're getting paid that much is because their brands expect them. Yeah, so X, and, y, and other people are looking at you too, your totally. peers. Like, there's that pressure as totally. well. Like, this guy's making that money and he's doing yeah. that. Well, it goes back to what, you know, John Weaver is telling me at Nike. He's like, you know, we, yeah, we're Nike. We expect something in return. If we're going to pay you this amount of money, we need to see an ROI on it. Like, we, we, need a, we need a return on that investment. You're not just good at snowboarding. You can't just do anything. Like, we need to market you. You need to sell product. You need to go to these, you need to go to sales meetings. You need to talk in front of people and, that's what I do so much at, like at Oakley now too. I go to sales meetings. We'll talk about stuff and, you know, whether it's the Olympics or goals or this and that, you know, it's like, what are you feeding back to the company that's feeding you, you know? So you and, talk at sales meetings. Yeah, totally. Get I, everyone hyped. Yeah, get, every, yeah, cool. get everyone, yeah, whatever it's Chris, you do that a bit too. Yeah, right? and it's good and it's cool and that's what you should be doing because that, it's not, snowboarding is evolving, you know, and th they want you to do these things and if you're not going to do them, then you're a less of an asset as someone else. Someone else will, you might you know? get cut. Yeah, so someone else will. So it's just that it's that good trade off. You know, you need to learn you need to learn those things. So everything growing up with me, you know, taking deals or whether it's an Apo or Loctite, you know, is all learning experiences for me going down the road, which I, I look back and I'm so happy that I've done all those things because yeah, I've I've learned so much along the way. You you know what's cool coming with age that's an intangible that lines up right with what you're saying. It's it's not something you can really put your finger on, but um trusting your intuition. I right. feel like as I get as I get older personally, I know like somebody throws us a deal. I'm like, I got a bad feeling about that. Mm -hmm. We're just not gonna do it. You just first you, you just got a gut feeling, you totally. know, and you're like, that's good or that's bad, and and that's a cool thing that comes with age is you're you're able to trust that intuition. You know when you're making a bad decision. That can go to the back country. That can go to deals. But it's kind of cool as you get older to trust that intuition more. Yeah, for real. Yeah, when I mean, like I said, when you're 18, getting tossed, you know, so many deals. That's why mm -hmm. people. And so many people, and whether it's core snowboarding or skating or whatever, say like talk shit on on selling out or whatever. But at the same time, it's like, dude, I got, I don't know, I don't want to regret this decision and mm -hmm. and not take it, and then you know get hurt next year, and not have a contract or something. You know, there's so many other things that weigh in to those decisions, and you just need to, you just need to, if you say yes or no, you need to live with that decision and learn from it. Another great point too is people that talk shit on a lot of different things, like for example, energy drink sponsors, right? They're you're like, that shit's so fucking whack. Why would you ever do that? Be interesting to see what those same people say if they had a deal oh, dude. getting pushed towards them. Dude, totally. Yeah. It's, like, it's easy to say that when you got no yeah. deal. They yeah. got no fucking deal. <laughs> yeah. Sign the sign. 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 Yeah. sign before they even no. looked at the fucking yeah. thing. Yeah. That goes and, back to people hitting big things and people saying it's whack. Yeah. The second totally. that deal's in front of them. Yeah. And like anything, like I was just saying with, you know, um, yeah, if, if you're more lenient on one thing or the other, I you know, mad respect if you just don't believe in that and you don't want to do it, but don't be just talking shit on people that are going to do that. You don't know what situation they're in or where they're trying to be. And, you know, it's just everyone, everyone's different, man. And you just got to respect that. And our industry needs the money from these people, man. Dude, totally. They do I mean, cool they've, shit. yeah, they funded a lot of stuff for sure. And they've done a lot of cool things. And, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, Monster's been so su- needed, yeah, Monster's yeah. been so supportive of me forever, you know, and, and for me telling them like, yo, I'm not gonna do contests. Contests are huge for and them. You would think they'd be like, whoa, man. Yeah, and mad respect to uh, Cody Dresser and Austin Hodges. There, they're you know they've backed me since day one. That Evan Lefevre actually, <laughs> he was at Monster. They he tried put to me on he's back pretty in the day. dope. I'm pretty sure Lefevre tried to sign me at my first X Games Big Air like on the drop on in. the spot. <laughs> yeah, hey, <he's> uh, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen up, you 16-year-old. <laughs> Just no. sign it now. Yeah, Cody not, Dresser and I used to be roommates. Too, yeah, which is they're funny. so I mean, good. He's, he's and Lefevre, too. Like, such good dudes that have worked there. So, yeah, mad respect to those guys. Going back to core score, let's just see how you do <laughs> in a little section called... Oh, what? God. Oh, it's we hit that one late. <laughs> That's <laughs> late. This will decide your course going yeah, yeah. moving forward. So yeah, this is well, this is huge. Uh, oh. This is also presented by the Dew Tour. Clint? We have a Dew Cup champion. Wow! In presence. Wow! It's been to many a Dew Tour. Many Had a, a lot Dew of tour. success from the Dew Tour. So Did they actually give you a Dew Cup. To the yeah, Dew it's tour. huge. Really? I have an edit on on Vimeo. I met with uh, Blaze and Griffin Siebert called "I Get Money" after I won the Dew Cup. It's, it's gonna it's all right. Pretty good. We're like we're like eating out of the Dew Cup. All right, we're gonna like put cereals. that in the show. Yeah. That'll be in the yeah. show notes. <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, right. uh, how confidence scale of one to ten? Got like seventy percent, sixty five. That's a one to one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, let's uh, let's put that at seven. So we we'll go. Yeah. That's a seven. <laughs> yeah, it's a seven, <laughs> six okay. maybe. Okay, here we go. Seven point five. You got it. JP, or er, <laughs> oh, this so. is the f- it's like the friends section in the resistance. True life. Very true close. life. That's an yeah, acceptable yeah, yeah. answer. Wow. That's true. an acceptable answer. But it is, is it the friends? It's the friends section. Yeah, it's the friends section. Do you want to ride with it? Good track, <laughs> yeah. do. Very good track. I believe it's corrupt. Is it corrupt? Uh, That's probably corrupt. What do we got here? It would be corrupt, yeah. Oh, so what, for the listeners, he's got a uh, bomb hole igloo playmate cooler. It looks all heavy over. Too. Yeah, things clean. I put a hoodie in there. I put a shirt. We got a, wow. a mug. We got oh, stickers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cheddar bisque stick. You got. Sh- that's sick. You might you might need a Loctite one next time. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna need some Loctite sticks in there. Uh, big time. I can't believe I missed up the resistance to truth. Oh, that was good, dude. I'll tell you, your your brother queued that up. He said he thought nice. you'd get it. Yeah. Sure. Well, I was there. Friend friend section. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a good. That's that. a tricky one. The friend yeah, friend like, section's a tricky. Well, you don't I thought it was remember that song. What was JP's in res- resistance? It was uh, uh, it was another. It was like sh- don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is how we do it. <laughs> I just say that every time. This is how we do. We've shut down here. Shakedown. Yeah, didn't we have it? It's funny. It's a rap song where he's driving yeah. around in the corner. Oh, oh, yeah. All the corn the, rows. Yeah, yeah. He gets, he gets stomped out. And, mm-hmm. yeah. That's a good That's mark, iconic, too. dude. Yeah. I mean, dude, those those videos for yeah, sure shape everything. I, don't remember it. I think everyone can probably say the same thing. It's mad cliche to say, but, dude, Resistance, True Life, man, Optigrab, T- TB9, all those ones, Shakedown. Your core that score arrow, is skyrocketing. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, that was, dude, me, me and my brother and even my sister, too, we lived off those videos, man. It was unreal. Uh, Get that on repeat. So on we're, still, repeat. we're still in Name That Video yeah, Part. We got one more. Oh, so yeah. this is part two of uh, Name That Video Part. If you know the track, comment on Sage's photo on Instagram for a chance to win what, bud? Prize pack. Here we go. Well, we would like to thank you guys for playing. I ain't got that one, dog. <laughs> I don't know if I got that one either. <laughs> that's a new school. That's new gen. Uh, no, that's, that's new school. That's some new shit. New shit. Um, new shit. While we're on this, we should talk about we're doing a giveaway with GoPro. Oh, we are. What's the what's the criteria here? All right, on my on my bomb hole post, I'm gonna give away a GoPro, and uh, if you would comment why you need a new GoPro in the comment section, I will choose a winner, and you will get a new. GoPro Hero 9. What is the criteria that you're looking for? I'm looking for uh, something offbeat, something funny. What are you going to use it for? Okay. I'm going to probably yeah. start a burner account and yeah. get, some, yeah, get yeah, some in yeah. there, see if I can't win yeah, this yeah. GoPro. You know what I mean? <laughs> I dude. get that. Shouts to GoPro. Shouts uh, to GoPro. They, we, we have one we use on the set, and thank you to Davey Schmidt. And thanks for the upgrade because our old lens was... I had one that I like, dropped. Uh, yeah, it, looked yeah, like, it looked like sandpaper or cement. Like, yeah, it was, and it was only <laughs> on the the guest phase too. So, thank you for the new one, guys. Yeah, bad so shouts. Let's get into fast forwarding <laughs> to this past season. I guess it's two seasons ago now, but you went in to joy. Yep, the video. Um, it was incredible. You did a back twelve over Chad's gap. Rider of the year. You won video of the year. Rider of the year. What else? 
uh, the video part, or it's not video part of the year. It's just it's video. like video footage of the year. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, we walked away with three. Pretty good. Video footage. Yeah. I heard most of that or most. Yeah. I don't know. Most valuable. Oh, video, most valuable video part. Yeah, yeah, part. yeah. Yeah. I don't know. MVP. Did I present? I presented one to you. I think you did. I'm pretty sure he yeah. did. Yeah, we got power. I'm pretty sure you're it. not sure what you're little. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I remember him. It might something. have happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, so coming coming into filming for Joy, we all we actually me Ferg Red, um, Ryan Runke put it together and Aaron Blatt. So those dudes those dudes really pushed for this to happen, which is awesome. Um, and so we all met up. We had met up in California actually. Um, everyone's down there. I think they were down there for some maybe some Red Bull meetings or something. And we all we all kind of had a little meeting of the minds of what we wanted to do. And we were all kind of all at the part where, you know, Red was, you know, it was after the Olympics and he, he had just won it. So he had, a, he had some freedom. Ferg, same thing. I think he got fourth at the Olympics. He had some freedom to go do whatever he wanted. And I was, you know, doing backcountry anyway. So we kind of, we sat down and really thought about what we wanted to do. And, you know, at the same time, you know, Black kind of drilled it into our heads. You know, if we all, if us three come together, you know, me, me, Ben Ferg and Red to make a video, you know, we, you better go off. You know, you can't just come out with some mediocre video part that three, you know, two Olympic gold medals and, you know, another, you know, fourth place has come out with some bunk video. So that, that was sick because that put some good pressure on me and the rest of the crew to really step up and show people what, like what level that backcountry should be on now. And so we went in the season, that's the queue up Rambo season. We started going in and, um, we straight up just started going dummy from day one. We went to Wyoming and we went to classic, uh, mosquito in there. And, uh, we, I immediately, I've been wanting to hit the ravine jump from, you know, art of flight. And that's, that's all since I was straight up 15. What's the name <laughs> of that jump? I I've heard super gap. I've heard ravine gap. I've heard, I've heard a couple other names. Yeah. You have to ask Ricky on that one. But, um, uh, I always just call it ravine gap. It's huge. It's like a, it's like a it's hundred, insane. it's like 120 feet. It's so massive. And it has a gnarly in run that compresses you right before the lip, and then you have barely have time to recover. So we had been eyeing that up. We hit that on like January seventeenth. It was our second jump of the year. It's like buck twenty, but that was just the level that we needed to be on, you know. And then there was nothing. There was no questioning that, you know. We hit a warm up jump, and then we straight up like that was straight up practice. It was just. It was not even basically filmed it was like okay let's just hit this jump get nope. some legs wind lip and jump that right one over. was huge the, what wind, up? the wind lip jump a few feet uh, to the right uh, i guess we did we tooled up that when we first got there it snowed so much mm-hmm. so we were just like let's get our feet under us and then we built um kind of right by boner jams uh it's a jawbreaker but yep. we, just, we didn't build it that po- we didn't build it that poppy it's the one that lego got busted mm-hmm. on out of flight switch back road or whatever yeah the switch back double road mm-hmm. so and ferg tried that on it which is insane step, to, <laughs> but we just didn't build that pop. It was our first jump of the or first real jump of the year, so we did that. I I literally was it was about to start dumping, and I literally st- we started building the ravine gap right after that, and that was that's just a, Rambo season. Yeah, that yeah, is Rambo that's season. Going hard. Oh yeah, it was just that we just we knew nothing else. It was just go hard for all season so that we could prove to people that we can do this, you know. And so we did that. Me and Fur got some good tricks on that. We had like back 10 and he got front 10, which is unreal. That, that started after that session, it was just game on, you know, after that, it was just flow state from there. Red was killing it. Ferg was killing it. Uh, Gabe came in the mix. Brock came in the mix. Haley came out for this a little bit. She got a clip. We just had a good unit going on and there was just literally not accepting mediocrity, you know, and we all kept each other in check. Like, should we even be hitting this thing? No, let's move on to something else. Let's get something If it's too small, you're like, yeah, it was just, yeah. And, or is it small? Okay. Do something really, really sick and stylish on it or, you know, whatever the case was. And yeah, we all, we all went to X games after, uh, after we filmed the ravine gap and everything, we just went hard. Like everyone was just partying and stuff. Cause we, it was like our last it was like this, our last two raw having fun. And we were buckling down for the next four or five months and just going dummy. And so we went into, we went into X games, had so much fun. Everyone's just partying, having a good time. And, um, Ferg was writing pipe. Oh, Danny Davis was in the movie as well. He had some really sick shots. So he was there. It was a full group vibe. You know, it was like, this is our crew. We showed up to X games swinging. We had signs like where the gimbal God is a clown. And like Nick <laughs> Baton is a virgin and stuff. Cause we, we came off a full high horse in Jackson, you know, and we had mad love for those dudes. We were just like, we came off such a heater in Wyoming. We were just like, we're going to X games clowning on everyone. <laughs> but all, that was where you did knuckle huck and you were doing backflip shifties. At the bottom. Yeah. I was doing back. Dude, it was just so sketchy. I think I was like probably hung 
hungover doing those and just like didn't care about my legs at all. <laughs> just going backflips to the bottom. <laughs> and uh, yeah, literally to flat. Um, but yeah, it was so that, that tee just said like, all right, let's go back. And so we, we leave X games, like, you know, five, six days of like partying with everyone. And we literally go back to Jackson. It was just me, Ferg and Tyler Orton and Tyler Orton, who is the mastermind mastermind behind joy. Um, for those who don't know, he's the king. But Red and then went to Japan to film some stuff, and we just went back to Jackson because we wanted to tool up Birthday Gap, which is like another famous gap. And yeah, Birthday Gap. It's a bad, bad boy jump. It's not as big as Ravine or anything. It's, you know, it's probably 80. I don't know. We built it huge. We built it really so poppy. poppy. So poppy. Yeah. Uh, we built it huge. It has this like kind of hippish landing that is so hard to landing, and then it just goes into this, you know, little, cr- it's a creek. And so it just bottoms out when it's not really filled in. So, you know, it's like, we just came off like a five day or <laughs> X at X games. And we just start building, building this birthday gap, like so big and poppy. And I knew I was like, do I want to cab 12 this thing so bad? I know. Cause I know, I think Pat Moore has, yeah, he has that, a six but, shot on his it. front or front 10 maybe, or no, he, he is, has a front but... 10 on it and nine one nine one. And I think Pat has a back 10 or switch back 10 on it. So I was like, okay, I need to, that was where we had. I was like, okay, I need to one up those guys. You know, I was like, I need to go cab double 12. And so, I start tooling up these catable 12s. I was, dude, I was getting bucked. We made the lip so poppy. And Ferg laced this ill switch back five right away. That got me juiced. But it took me like eight tries of this cab 12 for like, dude, if, if you don't know, just chucking that off this jump that you made, that it's just, it's hard with this, you know, cor- kitty corner landing. So I finally get that. And it was just, that was such a relief because that further instated like where we were at, you know, like Ferg had an insane clip on it. I got a good clip on it. We just kept that momentum going all year, you know, and it, and it culminated in basically we were in Whistler to walk everything. The Chad's gap story is pretty funny because we were in Whistler and it had gotten, it had gotten warm and windy and, you know, it just, it wasn't looking like it was going to turn on. And I literally, I make the call to the trusty Mike Boggs and I'm like, what's up with Utah? I saw there was a storm coming. He goes, it's dumping right now. You got to come back. And I literally, I'm like, yo, let's go hit pyramid gap. And then maybe we can build Chad's after hopefully that was the, that was like the setup. So we literally leave, we were out in the back country when I called Boggs, I found, I got service. <laughs> so he's like, come back to Utah. So we go down to the sled lot, literally pack our belongings in Whistler and start gunning it back to Utah. Ferg had to make some like a trip to to Bend first and home, and so I just gunned it back. And I met up with uh, it was me, Baden, Malachi, Boggs, and I think that was it the first day. It was like a lo- little crew building chats, which maybe T Bird. Yeah, uh, T Bird wasn't there yet, but um, Jack Daw came and helped build. And so, well, we rolled up first off, and we start hiking up the Pyramid Gap because we're like, hey, let's let's get. A- Pyramid Gap was almost like a warm up, which is funny because it's huge too. And we were rolling up, and if you if you ever walked up in, in Grizzly, you can see Pyramid is above Chad's, and it's the kind of like a sliver through the trees at first. And we could I saw a lip, and I was so mad. I had a, I had a minor meltdown. I was like, we just drove all the way, and then Baden's sitting down, and he's looking at Chad's. I look back, and we're both looking at Chad's, <laughs> and he's like, "So Chad's Gap." And we just literally huffed it over there. Like, no one's beating us to Chad's. No one else was around. But <laughs> like, no one's beating us to Chad's gap. And we literally just started chucking it up, like us four. So it wasn't an old lip on Pyramid. Someone was building it. Someone had already, yeah, they were hitting it. Was it the crew, it was the ski, I think it was the skier, Tim McChesney. Oh, who so was they like, probably would have went to Chad's next. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure they wanted to. Yeah. So we immediately just started chucking blocks up. And we were in such a rush because we had such a small crew. And for those who don't know, Chad's gap's a, a clean three days build. Like full you day. guys caught it on a tremendous snow year. Tremendous. Snow sometimes year. it's like a five day. Yeah, sometimes it's a five day. Just the, dealing the with snow. Yeah, the kicker goes up in a day, and, and then the, the running is just gnarly. Handling the compression. Yeah. So we start building, and and an all the heat of the moment, I you know I was kind of the one you know it's like let's build here, let's do this, and I you know I eyed it up from the lip, and I didn't go back to the in run. Classic mistake, or not a classic mistake. It shouldn't be a mistake, but I mm-hmm. made that mistake. And um, I go up to the in run after we're kind of putting like, you know, three or four blocks up, you know, pretty much a whole day's worth of build with like four or five people, which you should for sure have like eight people building chads all day. Yeah. And I, I have another mini meltdown. It's complete, it's not possible to get to the lip from the in run. 
it's so far to the left. I sat <laughs> like there. You we couldn't had, get a line. Dude, we had been building <laughs> it for wrong. like seven hours at that point. <laughs> and I'm just, I was like, dude, what a rookie mistake. Like all year, this like this moment. And it's like clouds are coming in in three days. We, ha- we have to hit it in two days. Ooh. And so at that point, Ferg and everyone rolled in and we all just started going to town. I'm like, yep, good news, bad news. The lip's going up. It looks great. We have to build another lip next to it, though, to match it up, <laughs> which was sick because we had this humongous lip. It was like a, it was like a Breck freeway jump. <laughs> <Dude, it was, laughs> you could take a car off that thing. It was insane. Thing, huh? You could take a car off that thing. So once we got that done, we, were, we still we left the second day of building. We still had so much. We hadn't even started the in run. And we were, or we kind of had slipped it in a little bit, and we were planning on hitting it the next day. I can't even believe you pulled it off. Anxiety. Full, yeah. full blown anxiety. And so uh, the Cliff Lodge set us up, which was dope. We stayed like right below it at they Snowbird. Did? Yeah, it was so cool. They, they set up the crew, major shouts. Um, and so we all, we all went to bed kind of knowing we had work to do in the morning. We were so sore, dude. It's like when you're building that, dude, you're moving tons of snow, literally. So we wake up, everyone's like, dude, this is it. Like we're going we're gonna to go hit Chad's today. And it's like not even close to being done. Oh, really? So we build four more hours that day. And it gets all done and we're like, okay, we're ready to hit it. You know, and everyone's so dusted. May, uh, another little pro tip. If you're going to hit a big jump, clip the toenails the night before I went full toenail clip. Ooh. So nice in the boots, two pairs of socks, fresh socks going into the sash. You learn these things, you know, you pro learn tip. these That's things. That's a pro tip. That's a pro tip. After but, all this four hours of digging, yeah, you change your socks. Yeah. yeah change the socks. Fresh. Yeah. Hold on. Sorry, sorry to rewind, but uh, while you're leaving the Cliff Lodge, if you're if you're interested in this story, Sage on his Instagram highlights uh, has this yeah. entire thing catalog, and it is a fucking journey. You guys have to go to his Instagram page and click on it because you're playing Scarface that morning <laughs> yeah, in the hotel I'm room. I'm so glad you. I wasn't gonna bring it up. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Like, <laughs> they're playing the Scarface like Ender scene song. Yeah, and done. they're like on their way to Chad's. There's so much <laughs> like build up. So you guys got to make sure you watch that as he's telling the story. Yeah, yeah go to my highlights on my page. So yeah, we're ready to build it, or I mean, we're ready to hit it, and uh, we all Rochambeau, and you know Ben's about to go first, and we. So little another pro tip. Did he lose or win the Rochambeau? <laughs> he. He won, so he went first. He chose to go yeah. first. Yeah, so um, a little pro tip. Uh, Tanner Hall had hit it two years before. He, d- he double back flipped it. So he went to his Go. I went to his GoPro angle on Instagram and screenshotted where he dropped in. And you can see these like little mini bush trees. It's like, okay, you point it from here. But our these s- are different. Snow, dude, so, <laughs> so, so snow, so like, yeah, the snow was different too. We saw everything and everything. different. Dude, Ferg points it into it, dude, so fast. He would have gone full, like, probably farther than, than T. Rice did in pop. Like, he would have landed in the other goalie, bottoms out, and, like, goes off the goes off the lip and all of us at the top. Because you see the whole thing from the top. It's so nerve-wracking watching other people hit it. Because they don't just disappear or anything. Like, you watch the whole thing. And he, he flies off the lip. I'm like... Uh, okay, maybe a little bit slower, but but how much slower? Because <laughs> it's like then you're gonna knuckle it. I don't know if you want to bottom Wait, he out. Compressed or you wanna... and flew in the middle, right? Is yeah. What you're saying. So just for the lane, which is yeah, yeah, it was so heavy. So um, I think Baden hit it next. He like, flew he, in the middle. Yeah, yeah, he like flew into the middle off his back, like into the cat, into the road, into the chasm. The yeah, chasm. <laughs> the chasm. <laughs> On his, he was so gnarly. He's okay. So, yeah, he was all good. Um, and so yeah, Baden went next. He laced it, and that just started this. That started the session, but. You know, the going back to, you know, what, what tricks to do off of Chad, you know, I, I knew, I knew building it cause I went to the pop premiere in Salt Lake. Mm. I went to the absinthe pop premiere when I was, I think I was 11. I came out in 2004. So I was 11 years old and I was, I was so juiced on T-Rice, dude. I wanted to be T-Rice so bad. And I was, I literally made a mental note when I was 11. I was like, I'm going to hit Chad's gap one day and like shut it down that was like my thing for really like, dude, my whole i can't tell you how many times i told my mom and dad or my brother probably it's on the so, fridge or what so, dude straight up on the fridge but deep down <laughs> deep <laughs> down way so down the bottom deep. of the fridge yeah so my mom and dad and you know blaze growing up were probably so over me saying like i want to hit chad's gap one day and it finally lined up and i was like i need to do something on this jump that is super technical but also like also really dope so i wanted to do a back 12 a back double 12 on it because I had, I had already done a back 10 and a couple other tricks that you kind of want to do on Chad that are gnarly, but like safe. But back 12 is, dude, you come around blind. It's super scary trick to do. You go and mock a hundred. Like I'd rather do a cab 12 than a back 12. You know, this is you come around blind and it's on that dude. If, if you come around 
blind and knuckle it, you're on your heel. You're going to get domed so hard. But I was like, okay, this is something that if, you know, if you get this trick, it's going to be super, super gnarly. And, you know, my whole thing is I wanted to do it. So if you wanted to step the chads, like you got to do something like that. Like I wanted to scare people. That was my thing. So I did, it took me a couple of tries. I ended up, um, I ended up landing like fourth or fifth try on it, which is, you know, if you're get if anyone has hit it before, you know, shouts to everyone like Roman, um, Forrest, T Rice, Bjorn, all those dudes, um, super gnarly. Hans, yeah, There's a whole yeah list. Hans, whole list. Kokard, yeah. all those dudes, ma- major. The Kokard's shots. method was yeah, dope, super dope. So, Aspen hit it too. I mean, anyone who st- hit it knows how gnarly and and uh, and how fatigued you get hiking back up. It's like a twenty minute hike up. You know, it's really gnarly. It's so. Steep. After building, after building for those days and then going into that, you know, and, and back 12, you know, you're giving it, you're all off the lip. Like, dude, you're using every bit of energy on that trick. I find it's the top. I was like, dude, I, I'm, I'm not hitting this again. I straight up, I can't, I can't, I don't think I can. And I was just putting that in my mind. I'm like, I'm, I can't hit this again. You Had know? you landed any other tricks? No, I just, I did a back three and went straight to back 12. So I, I did it. I, I real I like went, you know, went back to my, kind of contest state of mind of being like, what have I been doing wrong? I kept trying to over rotate and see and spot the landing. Cause it's so blind and it's so scary on that. I was like, dude, just don't even don't think about that. Like spot it under your, under your shoulder. So I came around at 10, I like look down and I'm coming into this perfect little, like not bomb hole, but just little track. And I see, it. I'm like, dude, no way. I just land and I just get stuck in the track and I just go straight out hauling ass. Oh, and it I like get, locked you. It locked me. Dude, if you watch the, the clip, clip I, so land, I land in this like little kind of pocket that just juiced me from going over to my heels because you're spinning so fast. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, I land that, get to the bottom. I'm just tripping. I'm laying there. Like this is the, you know, I've been waiting for that moment since I was 11. You know, it meant more to me than than just hitting a jump or getting a trick on a jump. Like that was my almost like lifelong goal before even the Olympics. You know, that was, that was something that I wanted to do and prove to myself since I was a little kid that I could do that. And that, they just meant so much to me to even hit that in the crew and then get the shot at the end of the day that it like, dude, I was just, dude, I was after hearing this story, I might buy one yeah. of the signed prints we got. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, dude, this no. is insane. Yeah, T-Bird no. was there and he yeah. called me the day after the session and was just like, that was probably the, most insane session of my life. Sick. Like, that's cool. These dudes put it down. Like, Sick. That's just rad. wait till it comes out. Like it's the best session on Chad. Like he was just hyped and Sick. he gave us that photo of you. So we'll be putting that cool. on the website. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody wants it, I might buy a couple. So you better get it. Yeah. Quick. yeah, I, you know yeah. What I, mean? I might start buying them and yeah. slanging them off. Dude. <laughs> Jack yeah, the price. It's yeah, going to be Jack all the sold out. Yeah. And then you're going to have a swipe up on your thing and <laughs> for, for more. Yeah. Straight up. You bought them all. all yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that culminated with joy, you know, joy and, and then ended up winning movie of the year. I got rider of the year, then the most valuable video part, which to me meant so much too. Like Olympics meant so much to me and like X Games medals or Duke Cup. But at the same time, I really wanted the notoriety to get, you know, the rider of the year. I looked up to so many dudes that have won it that I wanted to get that, you know, and I I just I didn't get it any other years. And that was you know, I, I told Ruff, <laughs> my agent, not to keep saying that, but I told Ruff you know, going into the year, I was like, I'm either winning rider of the year or pretty much dying trying, man. Like, I don't want anything else. Like, I just want to win rider of the year this year. And that was a huge goal. That was a huge goal of mine, you know. And um, to walk away with that, doing that and feeling feeling that afterwards was so, I felt so completed, you know. But I also, that gave me such a good drive to be back where I think I should be snowboarding. It brought me, and in uh, going back to being with people that lift you up, you know, Red, Red, Red and Ben Ferguson are some of the best snowboarders in the world, dude, straight up. And they're such a good, they're such good people to be around because those dudes will push you on and off the mountain and just, just, and they're your ride or dies, dude. Like they'll be with you till the wheels fall off. And that's, that's where we started talking when me and Ferg were up in Revelstoke, we, um, we were hitting this jump together and we, we both got tricks on it. We were super stoked on. And that's when I, we started, I was like, dude, you get out what you put in, man. And it was because it was like, it was like March at that point when you've been grinding that long. It's easy to kind of get these good tricks and then kind of kind of lay back. So, yeah, dude, we're, we're doing good. But at the same time, like, dude, you get out what you put in. We need to keep going. Like, don't accept this. We need more. We can do more like we this is not as much as we can put in. So that's where you get out. You get out what you put in came from. That Ferg's got a method, too. <laughs> dude, he's got a method. So you're hey. talking R.O.T.Y. or die, huh? So going back to the winner with joy. Uh, you ended up winning Rider of the Year. 
Now, the thing that was incredible about that was when you won at right at the writer of the year awards, you know, there's people, everybody wins an award and they're like, I want to thank my mom, my dad, my uncle, my sponsors. And then they'll go on some three minute tangent and you're like, great. I, yeah. I don't, I don't fucking care. But then you get up there and this dude, I'm like kissing ass right now, but it really like gave me chills. Sick. You won writer of the year and you literally go up to the podium and you say, you get out what you put in and you accepted the award and you walked off. And that to me was fucking like, it just, it's like, Hey, I work really fucking hard and this is what you get. And, and that's what people need to fucking hear. It's like, I hate to say it. Like that is the most important fucking thing you could say. And it's more inspiring than a million thank yous. It's like, you get out what you put in, whatever you're doing, whatever, there's a direct result with the amount of effort you put in to what you get out of it. And our, and our fucking society in some instances doesn't understand that. Yeah. No, 100%. I mean, that's why we started, that's why I started saying that stuff. And then another thing I started saying during the year of joy is like the, the grind don't stop till the rail ends. You know, it's just those things, just, <laughs> those things are so key to have, you know, like when you say those, you really start believing in them. And I, you know, I think, you know, some, some things you see on Instagram and stuff that, you know, they try to teach you some type of way, even if they're trying to help you, it's like, you need to wake up at 6am and do yoga. And then you need to like, you know, you need to make this goal sheet. You need to accomplish every day. That's a lot of stress to put on someone. But it, but when you just leave it a little bit more loose and say, like, hey, you get out what you put in, that's just, that is hard work, dedication, ambition. Those are the things that you can just strive for. You don't need to make, you don't need to make every goal or this and that something that you need to check off every day, but you need to work hard. You need to try something new. You need to just be in the state of mind where you're trying to be better. Mm -hmm. Like I, I wake up and I'm like, how am I going to be a better me? You know, that's how I wake up. You know, can I, can I be better today than I was yesterday? And it's just a, it's, you can't physically, or, you know, you can't literally just wake up and just be better every day, but that's something you can strive to do, you know, be more accepting, be more loving, you know, try harder, do something you're uncomfortable with. Those are the things that come out of you get out what you put in. And another thing I want to touch on on that, which is beautiful what you just said, is that I think sometimes people think that you, you, you need to do one big thing to get somewhere. And, and success is actually a series of all the small things combined. Like all, your success comes from you being like, I'm going to do cab fives and then I'm going to learn cab sevens and I'm going to do my checklist and every day setting a little goal and doing it. Success is like, you know, not to be fucking Tony Robbins, I'm getting on my high horse, <laughs> but I'm fired up right now. But I think that, um, you know, it's like starting your day, maybe making your bed. If you do that every day, maybe, maybe, um, you know, going to the gym at first, it sucks. Then you're, then you're in there, you know, a month later and you're like, this is what I do. And, and that's all, it's a series of small actions. It's not, it's, it's all the devil's in the details. It's not one big thing you do to get right. There. No, you're, you're spot on with that. You know, um, I think people look at, at success as this thing that's, that is unobtainable, you know, and that other people, other people have it and that you don't, you know, but you can, you can have success in every day. You know, if you, yeah, if you wake up and, and do, you know, make your bed and then do homework and, you know, get a better grade like that in itself is success. You need to look at those things and really, you need to respect what you're doing too, because maybe you're not, maybe you're not winning the Olympics or maybe you're not winning the world cup, but Hey, you did, you got an A on that test. You know, it's those things are building blocks for success that keep going your whole life, man. Like you can't let those go and you got to give yourself that respect. You know, so many people are down on themselves because, because they aren't like that, you know, and, and they're super hard on themselves, but you, you don't need to be hard on yourself to the point where you, you're, you're not giving yourself credit. And I think giving yourself credit is so key. You know, like if you're working your ass off and you're doing things that, that you maybe weren't doing last year or even a couple months ago, like that in itself is success. I, I love hearing that. I love hearing that because I think you look yourself on, compare yourself on Instagram. Maybe you're like, well, I did this today, but I looked at this person and they did so much more than me or they achieved some other great totally. goal. And you got to, you got to learn to celebrate the small successes and have that self self respect and that, and, and be kind to yourself. Cause we are, people are so bad the way they speak to themselves, especially mm -hmm. in recovery. When you see people that have gotten fucked up, you know, like are sober or something then they fuck their life up. They're like, I fucked everything up. My life's so bad. I've, I've done this and they beat them. The, the common theme you see with people in that are, that are struggling to get sober or that have fucked their life up. They always are so hard on the way they talk to themselves. Yeah. And that just drives them to get fucked up even more. I know. know. Yeah. And it's sad to see because those, if you know, you, you got to give yourself credit at the end mm -hmm. of the day for, tr for even just trying, 
And even if you don't get those things or you don't get that good grade, you know, if you, if you really tried and put your effort into it, like give yourself some credit. Mm -hmm. And then going back to also, I love, you know, to bring it full circle, but like going back to your Olympics, you know, the, the, basically you put it all on the table. It's the, it's the regret of not trying the thing is worse. Like it, the way I can equate it is like in snowboarding or maybe in, in my life, I've tried tricks and gotten bodied and the feeling of being broke and going home and knowing that you fucked yourself up, but you tried it is better than the regret of, I should have tried that. Yeah. Like I, I would, the regret is actually way more painful than the, than the fucking, the injury. You yeah, know? totally. Well, I think, yeah, people are so, people are so scared to take that step into the, and you gotta be, you gotta be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know that's such a weird cliche sentence, but you really do got to give yourself credit for just trying or, and like maybe you, maybe the success in it is the, is the adventure there, you know, like, like there's that age old saying, but yeah, it's, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to have the, you know, the best grades or, or do the best trick, but all those little things along the way are ways you can win. Like, you know, you can walk away with, with that mindset. You know what? I, I killed it today. Actually, you know, I, I did study my ass off. I did, I did do that trick. And even though I fell 10 times, I ended up getting to the end or maybe you didn't even get it that day, but you realize how you can do it. Like that's how I would use every time trying tricks, man. I would try tricks when I was younger. You know, tricks came a lot easier as I got older because I under I understanded the tricks a lot more. And I do. I'm a I dissect tricks, man. I watch people's tricks. I put, I watch everyone do back tens, you know, and I watch how each one does them, and then I'll put the implement it into my my own writing, you know. But there's so many times when I was younger, trying to learn a trick would come really really hard because I wasn't understanding the trick. But all those tries made up for now. I look at like, well, I know a billion ways not to do this trick, mm -hmm. you know, and I know one really solid way to do it now, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like those, those, those failures make up your success. Mm -hmm. That's fucking beautiful. I get a, I get a question for you. That's kind of a personal thing. I wonder because I feel like whatever your mind is occupied with, like whatever you obsess about, you can become successful in and i think like what percentage of your mind is occupied with snowboarding like how often are, is, are you thinking about it uh i mean dude's 100 percent of the time I, not even in the summer dude everything. in the summer everything i do revolves around so i love snowboarding i want to do it to the day i die man i i this the I have so many things in life that I love, but there's one thing that I completely obsess over and it's snowboarding. I care so much about it and I love everyone that I've met along the way. It's my whole life, dude. It's like I met Easto when I was young. I met you when I was young too. I, I looked up to you and like getting to shoot with Easto and at some shoots when I was younger at the launch and everything, I was tripping. You know, I'd go home to my mom and dad like, yo, I shot with, shot with Easto and Pat Bridges. <laughs> Pat Bridges like acknowledge me, dude. Those are the things that you don't, don't lose that when you become pro or you don't like, those are feelings that are all along the way that stay with you, man. And so I eat shit, bleed. I, I go to bed thinking about snowboard, snowboarding. It's my straight up life. I love, I fucking love hearing yeah. that. Yeah. And something we talked about yesterday, you know, a lot of people don't know you struggled with a tick growing up, right? You want to explain how snowboarding? Yeah. How do you yes. that? Yeah. So I, I, I started developing, they're called, it's called complex motor ticks. Um, it, it affects a lot of, a lot of people in some are pretty, you know, pretty severe ways and some are pretty moderate. Mine started getting pretty bad when I was 10 or 11. I would, um, I would, yeah, it's just, it has to do with, uh, your mu like pretty much like muscle spasms almost, but they're involuntary. And so I'd, I'd be in school and I know everyone was looking at me cause I do these, I would squint, I'd use my face a lot. I would shudder my, my eyes, my head, my shoulders. I do it every 30 seconds or so. And it, it got to the point, you know, I would like, it really, really affected my, my childhood. Just, I knew people thought, you know, like, what is he doing? Cause I knew people, people didn't understand too. Kids didn't, they're not trying to be, they're not intentionally being mean. Like, what are you doing? And you don't know because you're not, I don't, I didn't talk to my parents at first. And then I started going to some, some doctors and it's like, basically, it's not like you're on your own. It's like, take some pills or, you know, just try to control. It. And so I found like snowboarding was the one thing, like, even if I was maybe doing it while I was riding a little bit, doesn't matter. I could let some, I could let all that out because it builds up. Like it's, it's a subset of basically like Tourette's, you know? And so when you don't do it right, you get kind of, you get like a little angst and you get angry, you know, or like it just not angry at other people, but just angry at yourself that you didn't do it right. You know, cause there's, for me, it was this, uh, a little bit of like OCD too. I'd have to do, do really, really complex 
ticks in a certain order. And if I didn't get that, it would really, it would, I would do it. I start crying pretty much like a lot. And so when I, I found snowboarding really let me let go of all this kind of pressure and, you know, release and stress and that it really, it really helped me get past it, you know? And, and I think for anyone that's dealing with that stuff, if you can find something that you just, that you love or just takes your mind off of it and let your body go, whether it's yoga or soccer or snowboarding, whatever it is, just find that and live it, man. It'll, it'll change your day. I know a lot of people deal with it and go through it and some are really bad and some are a little bit mellower, but that it really helps finding something that you can, you can let everything go and not, and not worry about it. Cause it involves, um, stress. It, it gets worse with stress basically. And so I've, I've gone through so many ups and downs with it. And I've, I always come back to like when I, even when I think about snowboarding, I'm in a better, I'm like in a better state, you know, it's, it, it's so crazy mm -hmm. what your mental psyche can do, man. It's unreal. I grew up with a kid with Tourette syndrome, and it was an interesting process. So it's kind of like a minor Tourette, yeah. maybe. Yeah, that's, that's really it's, interesting. Yeah, because even if it's minor, it still might have. Yeah. Did, did people make fun of you in school or people? Yeah, people. Would, yeah, for sure, a little bit. Not not you anything. Just got luckily, good at snowboarding too, and shut them down. Yeah, yeah shut them down. <laughs> but I remember going to nationals and stuff, and I remember this like one instance that it just stayed with me for some reason for so long. Like someone was like make kind of laughing and making fun of me. I didn't even know him, and I was just. Really? Dude, I like ran, I ran away straight up crying. I was like, dude, why are people so, so mean? So, and like, dude, people I haven't been, mean. yeah, I haven't, dude, I haven't obviously haven't been like the nicest person every day of my life. You know, I've had those. I look back, I'm like, dude, was, like, I shouldn't have said that or, you know, this, you know, this and that. But at the end of the day, like, dude, you gotta, you gotta see someone else's perspective a little bit. And that's just helped me. You're never, you're never going to be perfect with it, but just try to see someone else's perspective of what they're going through. So you look through everyone's lens and totally treat it, just how try, you want to be Yeah, treated. just try to like, yeah. like I said, you're never going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes or you might have made mistakes when you were younger. But if you can just, you can think about that and think about other people, it'll go a long way and they'll, they'll respect that a lot. I agree. Well said. Well said. Well, we're going to do a little pivot. We got another guest question Love presented a good pivot. by Solomon Snowboards. And by the way, we, I've been getting a lot of feedback that I shouldn't be using the, the word pivot as much as I do. Oh, really? Just, just I let you like, guys know, I'm going to do another pivot. I feel like <laughs> we also get, on the DMs, I get people like joking and liking it. They like they it. Like, well, yeah. we're going to keep using it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, here we go. This is from uh, presented by Solomon Snowboards, and this is Zach Hale. Wow. What up, bomb hole listeners? Zach Hale here. Sid, I got a question for you. I've been in California, kind of off my gym routine, doing some other things. Do you think you will finally be able to bench more than me? That's what I want to know. I don't believe him. That's the most bro <laughs> question ever <laughs> asked. On Where the was he? Uh, he was, so that's, that's like a fraternity to, question. To, to, back, <laughs> to back up this, a lot of people send me an uh, audio file, a voice memo. He sent me a black screen recording just black screen. Well, like a like video. he turned like, his phone and recorded like the video. Like, it was dark out, and I think he was partying, and I think he was shit face. And um, <laughs> so he went behind like a dump. He went behind a dumpster in Encinitas. <laughs> you know, he's like just bloated and like just shit faced, like asking if you can bench more than him. It's just legendary. Could he I think I bench can, more than you. Uh, he could before, yeah. Oh, he's he got, could. He, dude, he's got strong. The guy's got strong I shoulders. Right. I think I got him now. He's, dude, he's off. He's he's off his gym. We've been in. Me and Granny's have been in sack. I've seen don't step footage, to us. Man. Don't step I've to seen us. Footage. We yeah. go. We go full bro. Yeah. Yeah. Full bro. Like it's our one time we can go full bro. No one can judge you. Yeah. There. It's <laughs> sick, dude. I back it so much, dude. For being a plant based dude, it's incredible to me that. It's your fitness level. Like, a lot of people think you can't get like that, and you are fucking totally. proving people wrong. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's something I definitely go, like, egotistical about yeah. sometimes. I'm like, oh, I'm plant-based. You know, I'll go I'll, I'll go harder than you or this and that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it works really good. I, I um, you know, I, I ran a marathon this summer and, you know, fully, like, plant-based the whole time. Was it no. the turkey trot that goes on every Thanksgiving? <laughs> Cottonwood Heights? Per, the excuse maybe? why Bud's is late to every single <laughs> yeah. shoot. Dude, the, the turkey, turkey trot's trot. coming up, dog. You it should is. enter. You yeah. should both enter. I know. That'd be I'll sick. be in front of my house, dude. With, hey, yeah. This is why I'm how many, late How many all miles time. is it? It's five? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm in. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. I can, bring I'll Phil. sign you guys up. Yeah. Bring Phil the dog. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Dude, yeah. there's, there's like thousands. Let's That's do the it. turkey drop. Everyone comes past my hood, and I can't leave the house, dude. I'm like stuck up there. <laughs> there's been it's a pow day. I'm stuck. There's police. Not let, it's, for, so, it's a for real deal. For the backstory on the turkey trot, real quick. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, we've always given Bud's shit because every year we've, we'll be shooting around that time, we'll be, and, and Bud's will be, we'll be at the spot waiting for him. 
And they'll be like, guys, there's a fucking turkey trot. I can't leave my house. And we actually thought it was a fake <laughs> They thought I made it up. We thought he made it up for the <laughs> longest time. That's so good. And eventually, he sent us a video of the people running in front of his house. There's and hundreds houses. of people. Yeah. And anyone dressed up? Like, and dressed up by turkeys? Oh, uh, they're just all walks. Oh, uh, yeah. It's just, there's even babies and carts and crazy people dressed up for the sure. It's a wild. Classic, you classic turkey it. trot. You got what was your marathon? What are we talking? We're uh, we're talking. I did the I did the Mid Mountain Marathon up in Park City. Oh, you were up elevation. I was up at ele- yeah, it Big started dog. starting elevation was eighty two hundred feet. Woo. Um, I don't think it got lower than eight thousand, and uh, or no, I think it ended a little bit below seven. It had like dude, it was, it was gnarly. I definitely That's under- just everyday life for you though that elevation, right? Yeah, pretty much. I live around like sixty seven hundred, oh, okay. and so I I kind of I kind of. <laughs> Crack can. We're crushing can. <laughs> Sorry Crush, to interrupt. Crushing carbon. Deleting water. cans. I definitely underestimated it. You know, I definitely, I didn't, I don't know, dude. I just, I signed up for a marathon pretty much this summer. Never just, done one? No, I never done one. I, I've run a bunch, you know, quite a bit you know, every summer. I, I run, you know, just for fun. But, you know, like May came around, it was quarantine. I thought, I thought, okay, I'm going to sign up for a marathon and just, and just do it. And so I started training. Uh, Todd Cupkey, who like, used to be he's a big time runner. Yeah, he's dude. He's not. He's an Iron Man. He's done plenty of marathons. He's he's a savage. But he hooked me up with this little. Uh, you can buy these kind of like training schedules, basically, of like how much you should run every day, when, what, you know. So he sends me the last like nine to six, it's a sixteen week plan. He sent me like nine to sixteen so that I would kind of. I was just. I was just. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just running like every day. Like Forrest Gump out there. I was like Forrest Gump. <laughs> Wake up. Well, I don't know how I'm going to run today, I guess. I don't, I don't know really where. Know. I, don't I don't know why. <laughs> I have no idea where, why, or when, but I'm going on a run. And so, dude, through training, it was, it was all good until dude, I like a little pro, little pro tip as well. Don't go to Mount Hood for three weeks, a month and a half before your marathon. It will kick you in the ass. Later, just because you were partying, or no, we were just not was just like training, snowboarding so much, and then mountain bike. I was trying to run. I just I lost my just schedule. Different dude. shit, just different stuff. And then, uh, dude, I mean, your legs are just beat down from riding and mountain biking, and then you try to go on some runs. So I I got home. I had three weeks till the marathon. It was the th- like three biggest weeks of running. It's like, dude, like you're running like sixty mile weeks. You know, it's a lot. You know, and so I get home and. I start run, you know, running like a maniac, you know, getting right back into the schedule that I skipped for three weeks pretty much. <laughs> so I'm like a little, little, little backtrack, but I kind of had an ego about it. I was like, dude, it's all good. I've been, I'm in shape, you know? I start running. I start, do I go on these runs? My stomach start like, I just wasn't ready for the <laughs> mileage that I was at hand. Do I go on these runs? Just do my stomach would be in curls. I, I think I shit like on four or five different runs. You shit on the run. Dude, mid the rear. Run. So gnarly, dude. Mid rear runs. I I had this I had this one. Don't trust anyone unless they have a good shit story, I've by the said way. That, yeah. dude. No, I've heard I know. Matthew McConaughey say yeah. that. No, totally. Yeah, I have I have so many. I have too you many. Can't trust I have them. you almost gotta, you know, don't trust him and that's too many too. Like I'm almost in that <laughs> I'm almost in that I'm almost too, in that realm. Honest, I gotta dude. yeah, I gotta start clenching, dude. But uh yeah, I'd be do I'll be on the trail just you know, dying like my stomach because I was, I really should have, you know, been training a little bit better. And, um, dude, there's this one time it was like starting to hail. There's no bush. I'm in the middle of a field, dude. And it's a like big up in park. There's nowhere season. to go. There's nowhere to go. I'm straight up shitting in front of people, dude. I'm like, don't look at me. <laughs> dude, <laughs> no stop. Bridesmaids. <laughs> there, bridesmaids. Yeah. Full bridesmaids style. <laughs> hot lava coming. I'm oh like, my. dude, this is, and there's then, literally nowhere and then, to hide. Huh? Dude, there's nowhere to hide. There's That's nothing. So, so, so I get happens. up and then I'd have to run like three more miles. And dude, it was so just <laughs> pooey butt crack, crack with. dude. Pooey butt nothing, crack scenario. Dude, it was, it was What'd you so, wipe with? Nothing. Dude, uh, dude pro tip for when you got to shit on the run. Yeah. Rip off a sleeve. I know. Whenever I just, you see me come out of the back country with one sleeve. Yeah, you got a beater on. Like, you're like, what? Dude, shit. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to touch my running shirt. I didn't just have that many. sleeve <laughs> off, dude. Yeah, the one Also, those aren't really a sock, ha- piece of a sock up top of a sock. Yeah. You need your socks to run. Yeah, you need But one sock, sleeve yeah. goes. Yeah, it's not cut. It's the a little The material awkward. is like, it's a little too breathable. It's more of like a sandpapery feel. You want cotton. Yeah. You want cotton for sure. Cotton. But if you got have it. Also, I had nothing. Didn't you do a double, a triple cork and shit yourself or something like that? Yeah, so that was. Dude, was that a fear based? That or an was impact that was based? full impact. So it happened twice in a row, different um, times. Yeah. So I we did this shoot called Sage of Palooza when I was seventeen. Sage of Poo. Poo? Sage of Palooza. Sage of Palooza. <laughs> Sage of Palooza <laughs> on the backside of Mammoth, and there was just so we tried to set it up. It was right when McMo did his first triple. 
Torstein had done oh, his. I was like, okay, hey, well, I need to get in the triple squad. And I was 17. And so, you know, we have the the mammoth dudes, TJ Dawood, would build this. I'm like, oh, let's build a triple court. TJ builds the gnarly, the biggest jumps. <laughs> it's this like 90 foot jump to learn triple corks off. It's so gnarly. And the weather was horrible. The last day of the shoot, I'm just like, okay, I got to go for it. And the, it came around at triple, but I, I landed a little bit. Um, past 1440 oh, and I just smack back and impact just shat my pants. And so I don't tell anyone I get back up. I'm like, okay, wh- let's go. One more again. That was it. Go back up. Same thing happens. I come around, like hook my back edge and it, Dude, more came out. Two Shit. times in a row. I two timed it, dude. You have <laughs> so, to throw the shorts out after? Well, so, and so the, the shoot was insane. The Warbringtons were there. My brother was there. Like, Mason Aguirre is there. Like, no all time. these, dude, all these, Griffin Siebert was there. Stax was there. I get like a sled ride down because I'm so bodied. My back is seizing up. I'm like, I got to get down. I got to get down to the hotel. I run into the room. I just throw my boxers in the trash. And they all come home like, dude, what smells so <laughs> bad? Because I threw it in like this kitchen sink. No, you didn't. <laughs> That's I had, fucked up. I had no bad roommate etiquette. Uh, yeah, right dude, there, I, had, I, had no, I had no respect for the homies on that one. They got so mad. I had to like, it was bad. But uh, yeah, no, yeah, good. not even in your room or outside. No, nah, just ki- kitchen. Well, that's just kitchen. mad disrespect. They're all coming dude. back hungry after a session. <laughs> it just smells like like dry sage of uh, dry dock shit. Like yeah. submerged shit in the water is one thing. Like yeah. a shit in the that's bad when, enough. When you get the thing dry, just land based, they have dude. a whole different smell to it. Oh yeah, dude. it's horrible. It's awful. Yeah, like when there's in a, a confined space, in the bowl, too. A oh, breacher it's bad. in the bowl. Oh, the breach stinks. smells horrible. Yeah, the breach. When you got a beached whale, we talk a beached whale. It's above it. the waterline. Woo! <laughs> Those are awful. Oh, uh, yeah. The stank. Well, stank. Go, going back to uh, to marathon running, fucking Goggins, dude. Can you give me some inspo? What's Goggins? You, explain Goggins. to the people who don't yeah. know who David Goggins is and his role in your inspiration. Yeah, so, well, basically what inspired me to do the do the marathon was that I just, I picked up David Goggins' book, who's, he's a he's an ex-Navy SEAL, just a mental hard ass. He's just got a crazy work ethic, so... Um, I picked up his book and then by the end of it, that was what made me, I was like, okay, I'm just going to run a marathon and, you know, get uncomfortable and just do something that I've never done. And so that was the inspiration. And so that, that started silverback gorilla season. So, cause one of his, one of his Navy SEAL dudes in it was, they called him SBG cause he was such a, he was so gnarly. You're going to be a monkey, be a gorilla. Yeah. Just like, so yeah. So gnarly. So I was like, okay, well, silverback gorilla season, you know, like, you know, no more, no drinking pretty much just, you know, hitting, hitting weights at sect and then going and running like a maniac. And so that was pretty much my whole summer is just being, I was being a square. <laughs> Do you guys know that Salt Lake city has a silverback gorilla? Really? Went down there with my wife once dude. And we're in the fucking zone. I have a, my big beard and, uh, the silverback, this baddest looking monkey you've ever seen <laughs> goes fucking ape shit on you. Starts banging on the glass every time he sees me. And no. apparently the trainer came out and they asked me to leave he had a crush on my chick, the silverback, and thought like he, I was. Uh, he was aggressive towards me because he thought like I was up in silverback status. Wow, basically. well, silver. That, that's your spirit animal, <laughs> dude. That is. That's just your spirit this animal. fucking thing. I'm sitting by the glass, like with my back to the glass, and it charged the glass up behind me and went bam. Wow, you think and, you could go toe to toe with it? Oh, dude, he would have ripped my <laughs> they're fucking so, arms they're off. They're so powerful. He would have shit down my neck. But I literally was like asked to leave the monkey exhibit. That's so that's a, fun, like, that's a fun little yeah, fact. Fun that is fact. a good it, fact. It scared me. I didn't know what was going on. Dude. The, the guy was, And every time he'd like look at me and like do all this weird shit and then charge the glass. <laughs> and they're like, he has a crush on your wife and he wants to kill you. And I was sent out. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, Booty. funny incredible. silverback story. Well, going back to Goggins real quick though, his whole shit that people don't know is kind of, I could be wrong with the percentages, but when you're like fucking dying and you, and you think you got 10% left physically and you're doing something... He's like, that's where you're at, like, 50%, right? Yeah, that, it's, it's, it? it's 40%, I think, yeah. It's, so you're explain. only using 40% of your potential, pretty much. So, yeah, that I just What do you of, mean when you're dying? Like, like, I did a bad job of explaining it. He could yeah, probably do it better. When, when you think you're at, basically, like, when you're at your wit's end with, you know, say it's a run or, or working out or, like, a long bike ride, whatever it is, when, you're, when your mind tells your body, like, hey, man, you, you need to relax, you need to chill, you need to relax, you actually have a lot more in the tank. You just, your mind is trying to 
keep things at bay and not because there's a huge difference between you know like health and fitness and um paul from sect walked us through it really and it's like health is more about like injury and, and illness and sickness and stuff with your body you know like are you healthy are you without are you without sickness are you without in- injury and fitness is more are you fit to do the task at hand you know are you fit to run a marathon are you fit to lift you know a, cu- a couple hundred pounds are you fit to um you know hit hit jumps all day, you know, whatever it is, you know, are you fit to do that? So, um, yeah, I kind of just went to like a crazy state of mind this summer and just, yeah, hit gym a lot, ran a bunch, you know, did the marathon. I was super hyped on that. I don't know if I'll really, I I loved it. You know, you really, it, it really became therapeutic for me to go on runs because I would just go, I'd go no phone, no headphones, no music, nothing. Just, I had my, my watch on that would track me and that's it. It was so good. Cause with everything going on with all the, all the quarantine and COVID and everything, you know, not being able to be by everyone. It was, you know, it's definitely hard to like to channel into that, but going on these runs, I felt so lucky I could go and just get into my own world and really, really kind of address some things that I probably needed to. And, you know, I've probably been prolonging because you go on these runs and you, yeah, like you said, like you get, and you, you think you're done and you can, you can just keep going. You enter this crazy state of mind where you think like any, you straight up think anything's possible. The runner's high. Once you're yeah, on it. Runner's you high go, for sure. Huh? Yeah. Which doesn't happen like every time. There's definitely some ones where you just hate running the entire time. and be yeah. like, why am I as a snowboarder? This, your body gets pretty jacked. Do you notice when you go running that that comes as a kind of hurt sets you back a little bit? No. And every, everyone was, you know, a lot of people, when I started running, I told people I'm like training for a marathon at, Pretty much everyone told me to do your knees. Don't pretty yeah, much like, don't do that. Body, you know? I've heard for certain. So, yeah, for and I think for bodies maybe. Yeah, for exactly for different bodies. And then if you you know wrong techniques in anything can really lead you know, like wrong techniques working out or even yeah. snowboarding or this and that they can really hurt your body. So I did my research. You know, I got I got good stuff. I got good technique and and everything. I probably don't have the best technique, but you know, I definitely strive to be in a good technique the whole time because I knew my body could get jacked but the whole whole time I never my knees never started hurting or my back or anything but I think I was I was also putting a lot of respect to my body I've been going to the gym that we all go to like Jeremy Jones mm-hmm. you, guys are, you guys are in beast mode three times yeah. a week over there huh? yeah totally but though I mean that's helped me so much because really going going to the Olympics and everything I took that I took training really seriously going in I would go four or five days a week the fall before like summer and fall before the Olympics I was going to the Olympics strong I've seen you doing and, those jumps. Over yeah, the, we got, got, hops, got, hops. got yeah, the yeah. hops, dude. We got Ooh. hops, yeah. Um, but yeah, now you know. Now you know, and I kind of put it off for a couple of years. Just been like, dude, it's, you know, stuff's kind of whack. You know, I don't really like it. But now, as you get older, I really respect it and it's helped my body. It helps you recover. It helps you, you know. Now March, April comes around snowboarding, where like I hear a lot of people being exhausted. That's where I'm like, dude, I got. 50% left in the tank. Let's go, you know? Nice. And so, but it's just, yeah, you gotta, res- you gotta respect your mind. You gotta respect your body as well, you know? And, you know, if those two are in check, you can really, you can do a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. And also the gym, people, they're thinking about getting started. It's like, it sucks at the first week or two. And then I look forward to it. I look mm-hmm. forward to it every day. And, and it's like when we do it. And another thing going back to running too, it's like, I have a dog. And he needs exercise. And I got (laughs) sick of walking him because it took too fucking long. And so I I don't run fast. My body, my knees are kind of fucked up. And I'm I do 1.5 miles every morning, pretty much. You know, you know, and and that I don't meditate. I don't I've tried. I've I've tried to like I'm not like an avid person that does that, but that's my little form of it. Because you're just breathing and it's 1.5 miles. It's not a big commitment. But uh, bu- bubbly, <laughs> the bubbly burps. <laughs> Sorry, dog. <laughs> no, but, totally. That's how it became for me. You know, I, I you know, I, I like going to yoga. I like, I like sitting down and definitely taking some time myself. But I'm not, yeah, I'm not an avid, you know, meditator or anything like yeah. that. But that became it for me. Mm-hmm. I would look forward to my runs. You know, if I was, you know, because towards the end I was going on, dude, I'd go on like you know, 18 mile or a 20 mile or and all this stuff. You know, I'd wake up at five in the morning. I'd start running at five 30 and 20 no, mile ruler, really, huh? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, some pretty serious runs where it would take a bit, but you know, I'd start when no one else was out there. I had my, you know, my pack with my waters and my you know, electrolytes, my goo, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> and I'd walk out the door and I would literally look down like, I look like such a dork right now. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> I was so stoked. And, uh, but yeah, you go out there and do, there's something that is so amazing about just being out on a run or even if it's a walk, whatever, but you're by yourself, dude, it's, it is so calming and so therapeutic. I just don't even know how to explain it. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Well, one other point I want to bring up that's really cool 
is a brand you had that uh, mm. is called Anthem. Yeah. And you you probably learned a lot from that. You want to explain totally. Anthem and also what you learned from that whole experience? Yeah, totally. A cir- yeah, circle back with, with Anthem, the board. If everyone, you know, remembers those teal boards like me, Haley Langland, and and, Re- uh, and Baden were rocking. Um, Master Baden? Yeah, Master Baden. Um, yeah, so basically after Apple ended, I, I took a year of riding. I t- rode some blank boards and then... You know, I was like, where do I want to, you know, where do I want to end up? What do I want to do? You know, it's a good opportunity to kind of reset. And then I, you know, I was like, dude, it'd be so sick with, with all the stuff in the Olympics. Like what a cool way to like, if I just started a brand, maybe with some cool people. And I didn't really, you know, I, I'm not the most business, business savvy person. You know, I was like, it was me, it was Baden, Haley. And then Ruff was working with us too. And, you know, we went back and forth. We were all really busy too, which kind of just, it eventually took a toll and, um, dealing with factories is super tough too. It's, you know, it's, it's, heck, it's heck everywhere. Like, Europe, you know, we, Jonah. I, I, yeah, I pretty much tried to go everywhere and it's just getting your foot in the door everywhere. It's like your last on the totem pole, this and that. And then on, on that same, you know, schedule of, of them trying to get all the other boards in. Like, yeah, they have a calendar. They have a calendar. And if you yeah. Don't get in. Yeah. And so then, you know, my season's going, you know, everything is so busy. And so by the end is, you know, had the opportunity to still keep it going and it would have, and it would have happened. And, you know, I just, I really couldn't do that, especially for, you know, Haley and Baden, they have so much of their um, career left. I was like, listen guys, we can go one of two ways. We can keep going. And you know, this is really difficult. We're all trying so hard to do our careers anyways, or we go like, go do let's go do our own thing right now like if we ever you know wanted to circle back that's cool but i think like dude right now just we needed to go kind of ax it and it was really tough it i learned so much just like i was talking about earlier with you know things like an apple or a loctite or you know these things that you need to learn from it was such a good learning experience for me because i had this passion i knew i had such a passion for snowboarding i really thought i wanted to do the company and i still i did but in the end you know I, i learned so much about about my own passion for snowboarding and what I wanted out of it. And it was hard to let that thing go before it really took off. Cause we started this thing. We had a graphic and everything. Did you make right? samples? We made samples. Yeah. Just for um, riders basically. Yeah. For riders. Not sales samples. Yeah. Not for sales, but we had them there. They're super awesome. They looked cool. We had, you know, we kind of were all like mysterious off the gate. That was the vibe. Everyone was, there was like a private Instagram. People were starting to follow. Had like a couple hundred couple hundred and I, and I never, I never really mentioned the name. It just kind of like started getting out. And so it was kind of, that was like the theme of it. And then, yeah, it was just hard to, it was just really hard to navigate and do with, and then I felt like I had so much left to do it after joy as well with snowboarding. I was like, you know, I really need to take this time and respect my own career too, as well as theirs. I don't want to, you know, drag anyone along here. So, um, yeah, I had, I shut that down last, last fall, which was definitely really difficult to do right before things could have started taking off. And it's one thing that I, I definitely don't regret though. I, I would think I would have regretted, you know, keep, Dude, to keep trying and business. Yeah. It's, it's a seasonal, super hard business too. They're it's expensive. like, they're expensive and China, yeah. So Europe, like moving yeah. parts, like just dealing with, yeah. Factories and dude, like anything can go wrong. Shipping and stuff. It's and you have your own career going. It's hectic, but you know, after, after that I hit up, I actually hit up, um, well, I've been, I've been talking to Tommy J at K2 a little bit anyways, just about their production and everything, just, you know, picking brains and whatnot. But then I hit up Jay Stone, um, who I grew up with, who is like, you know, he's an engineer at, uh, K2 now. He makes an really, air horn. Yeah. He's the one, uh, for everyone, everyone that really is hyped on the alchemist. He's the one that, that's his, that's his baby right there. People are hyped on that thing too. Yeah. Right people here. are stoked on that's that That's the thing, one I hear so. most about. It's really there. sick. Yeah. He did my so, board too. Six piece. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. He, did. Can, yeah. But yeah he makes, yeah, he makes really great boards. So. I hit him up. I was like, dude, can I get, can I get on a K2 and just see how this thing rolls? And then I immediately got on, was so hyped on it. And I've been friends with Tommy J. He he used to be at, at Wendell's back in the day when I was 16. I went to like my first pro session there and he was there it's along with Mary Walsh. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, they just, they pretty much just took me in and like made me feel like family, which is so cool. Cause after a couple of years of just dealing with, you know, the Olympics and that, and the Apo, and then going to start my, you know, taking a year off, I, I wanted a home and I wanted a family and just, they really embraced me and just kind of took me in. Cause I have all my other sponsors really treat me as family too. And I, I think of them the same way to get, you know, right into someone that can really make you feel that way with the whole team. And, um, Pat Moore's there. I'm like good friends with him and I've definitely looked up to him as a mentor and, um, I really like riding with him. So when they signed him too, I was picking his brain. I'm like, how is it over there? You know, is it cool? And he's like, dude, it's so rad. Everyone's really chill. The boards are insane. And, um, everything's like in a, you know, forward motion and you know, they, yeah, it was really cool to, to culminate with that and just sad to leave that, you know, 
trying something and, and, you know, kind of going along with what we're just saying of, of, you know, more or less failing, you know, in that, but learning so much from it. And it doesn't really sound like a failure. Yeah. Not like a failure. Just like it didn't, you know, it didn't come to fruition really in the way that I wanted it to, but yeah, it's not like it was a failure is, you know, it's something that you just chose like, yeah, you're still shredding. How are yeah, you going to totally. be writer of the year and produce yeah, and was, boards and yeah, and you know, I like I like to put a lot on my plate for sure. Yeah. I like I like to I like that, but in is sometimes it is too much to take in, and um, yeah, it gets it and gets you're difficult competing against these juggernauts too yeah. out yeah. there. It's like you yeah. know, like no, I don't know. I think it's probably a good decision. Me too. And it's unless be- you were all in, you know, yeah, it's better to. I think it's always better to like try to do something and fail than mm. think about doing it. And so yeah. it's like, it's worse going back to, you know, that's a learning experience. Sometimes you got to do something to realize that you don't want to do it. 100%. And that's a big one thing I've learned. Like fucking try whatever, try whatever you want to try. And then most of the time when you try it, you're like, Oh shit, I didn't think that one through it. I don't actually want to do that, but I learned a lot, but instead you might go through your whole life thinking I should have started a board company. Or yeah, in 10 years, to... you could be like, all right, I at least got a little head start. I can do yeah, this true. now. Yeah. One hundred percent. Everything. Yeah. Everything happens. So but yeah, that not. was, that was a good, yeah. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about uh, the project that you did this past year. I heard you went dummy again. Uh, I heard you had another good winner. Yeah, we uh, we had a good we had a good winner. I mean, um, I wanted to I wanted to ride with Ferg and Red again a bunch. So they were doing the Burt movie, which is sick. But um, yeah, I tagged. I basically got uh, Gabe Ferguson and and uh, Big Air Jared Jared Elston to to crew up with me, and then we had Jared's a Patreon member. Yeah. Props. Oh yeah, yeah. Props. 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 yeah. yeah. I actually, just shipped um, Ferg a hat. I believe really. Yeah, sick. he just bought one. Which is available at bombhole.com if you're looking for merch. But yeah, continue, continue with your continue yeah. with your story. Yeah, so we went out. We had, we were a little unit. It was yeah, Tyler Orton, um, Jeremy Thornburg, who is the lick the cat filmer, nice. and now he's a multifaceted media production company. <laughs> um, and then yeah, me, Gabe, and Jared, and we just kind of we set up. We didn't really have you know we wanted to make something cool. We wanted to make it a little bit shorter. It's it's twenty minutes. Um, and we were, st- dude, we were on it again. You know, we were, those kids stepped up too, which is so rad going back to, you know, where I was younger and those dudes took me under their wings. You know, I wanted to bring these guys into something that they could be really proud of and work, work really hard for. And they really crushed it. And they, they did good. They stepped dude, up. They, they blew my mind. You know, they, they definitely, it was like every day they were hustling their hardest and they were learning so much. And, um, I'm always learning out there too, but dope kids, man, dope kids, dude. They're so rad. Um, they, and they like having, it's so cool cause they like having so much fun in the back country too, where it's serious back there, man. There's definitely some days you're out there, some, some high avi danger and there's some, you know, it's not all fun and games, but it's sick to be with the like kids that have all the stoke and they're just hyped to be out there. And that, that just, that makes the crew vibe so good because sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes I'll go out there and, you know, I, I am really intense and like <laughs> Ferg said, sometimes I'm a workhorse, you know, but I do like having the best time out there. Those guys know? are kind of chill, huh? Yeah, they're super chill. But, but then when it shows when it's time up, to jump. Dude, it's time to go. Those <laughs> yeah. kids are on it, dude. And they're good at landing and pow. They're good at seeing natural features too. So those kids got a long, long career ahead of them. Dude, they yeah. rip. And I heard you kind of were going kind of a little bit of a Benedict feel for some tricks. Yeah. You did some regulars. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, yeah. I wasn't, I didn't go. Yeah, I didn't have my whole theme being like, you know, tried to do, you know, mirrored tricks or anything. But I, I did do. I do do some like some you know back seven switch back seven you know, like the front seven cab seven the front nine cab nine and then like back double ten and switch back double ten all in the same like features you know Sick. so yeah it's, it's maybe cool. we can get a couple of those clips we'll get a couple, we'll get when, a couple when of those is clips this movie insert. dropping and all that uh this movie is dropping probably around the same time it's going to come out so if it has it's probably it's going to come out I think November 9th. um unless that's what I meant by or, dropping but yeah yeah <laughs> um, what's it called it's called Halcyon. So yeah, it's uh. What does that mean? It actually reme- It's uh. I'll probably butcher exactly what it means. It's basically like the remembrance of an idyllic time. So we just. It was funny because we said the name before, the pandemic and everything happened. Tyler was like, "Do I think Halcyon such a sick word and it means something cool? Like we've had so much fun making this movie, and then um, as the winter went on, and then you know everything happened. We're like, dude, that's such a good. It's such a good name for it. It was like it was so much fun making this and we were out there with our friends and just making really great memories that it just seemed right. Well, one thing that I think is fascinating about this project is that you had T.O. make it, right? Tyler yeah. Orton. And and then Germ was essentially like your social media content provider. He was. Right? So you guys yeah. would go out and film and then you get shit for the gram. And that's like the new age way of like 
being a true fucking professional, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to have, you got to do the social now. I mean, everyone, I, I like seeing everyone's stuff on social too. I like to see what everyone's up to. And, um, yeah, I think there's ups and downs of everything on social, but I think if you're putting out really cool stuff and it's good vibe, then I want to be seeing that. So you're we putting had, up shots from the movie or do special stuff, warm up shit. Yeah. Warm, warm, up. warm up stuff, just behind the scenes. Um, telling yeah, like, the story. Yeah. Telling the story, baby. And, uh, yeah, basically, we got to go to AK this year, which is awesome. Because I I'd gone up once with uh, Nils Minnick and Garrett Warnick. Nils Mud Dick is actually how it's pronounced. <laughs> worm. Nils Mud Dick. Yeah. Um, Shout out to those guys. Worm. You yeah. Heli? Yeah, we went to Heli, which was awesome because I'd never been. I really wanted to go up there for so long, and we got skunked the last time we were there. So we got we got like two or three days in. We we were like, yeah, we we didn't know exactly what we were doing doing up there it's nice to have i mean you've been up there yeah, it's like it's, it's, dude, it's wild dude it's wild to Haines or? we went to Haines, yeah and Haines is there's, Haines some, is there's some good stuff it's you know if someone's showing you around it's definitely easier but, but you didn't have anyone we didn't have anyone we had a really good guy isaac who's the band i think he's been with a lot of people yeah he's been with the absent dudes he's been with the pirates dudes burton dudes everything so um he was a he was definitely a good guy up there he's the man and um he showed us all he showed us everything really cool. rad and um it did get pretty windy up there and it got kind of gnarly for a bit, but we got some really fun stuff. And then we were up there. We didn't have no cell service or anything like at the house. We could go to town and maybe get like a bar at the end of the day, but um, we pretty much didn't know what was going on with COVID. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So we, well, we went up there, we knew we can you know, it was like, you know, early mid March or something. So we didn't, we knew stuff was going on. We weren't just turning a blind eye to Not it by level, anything, though. but as we were up there, I remember getting back. My girlfriend's like, uh, have you checked the news? Like, I think they're closing the borders. I'm like, what? There's no way. Really? And so I start, <laughs> we start calling around. They're like, yeah, they're not closing it right now. Stop talking about it, but maybe, maybe soon. And so we're like, well, we'll just keep riding, I guess. And by the end we rode and then people were like, dude, you need to get out. Cause we were deep, dude. We had, our setup was so crazy. We went so rogue going there. Um, we went, we were in, we were in Whistler. We left our trucks there. We like, we took one truck to the airport. So to get home, we had to go through, go through Canada to get back to the U S although we were already in the U S and Alaska and they were like shutting the border down and stuff. We're like, dude, what's going on? <laughs> like we were just riding, having the best time of our lives. And now, yeah, this is happening. We like booked it past the border. We got, we got back and yeah, that's quarantine. Everything happened. Were you pretty intimidated up there in Haines? Cause that's in my opinion, that's some of the realest terrain you you it gets get to, it gets right real there. real quick up there for sure, but yeah. I I love that stuff. I you know nowadays you know it's a little bit harder to get those trips and make them happen. Um, just you know with weather wise and and um yeah budget wise and everything. But dude, any chance I get, I love that riding so much. It's yeah. just that's the true beauty of snowboarding, man. That's some that's like what Craig Kelly was going for. That's what you know Hawkinson and everything and it's the top, T, top tier and, of the pyramid. It's top basically. tier, dude. If you can, yeah, if you can, if you can ride that stuff, then you are. You're a bad boy. So it was just getting getting the feet up there and getting into it. We got some fun stuff, some good stuff, and I like to do I like to do more of it for sure. I like I like it. I live for it. <laughs> Did you have any moments that you're like, oh shit? Um, not it's really too real. There no. was it. We we had a really weird like wind slab one day that was kind of ir- it was luckily nothing on anything that we were we knew it was pretty bad, so we didn't get we didn't get anything. But you know, me and me and Gabe were riding this face. I was really mellow, and it it broke pretty. Far, but not super deep on us. And then another one I was dropping into birthday bowl. Um, oh, nice! And it wasn't big again. Just like a wind slab happened. Yeah. You no, know, it just kept it kept you in check. You know, it was birthday good. bowl's intimidating. That's yeah, some shit. For sure, you can get into it there. But it was cool. It's so rad watching all the. You know, when you watch all those parts of. I'm a big fan of Manuel and J Rob. Yeah. So, you know, we were nerding out on their part. I always nerd on their out on their parts, but when we were up there, like we were watching stuff. We actually watched all the absinthe flip sides this winter sick. that you are all over. Oh, really? <laughs> so I didn't sick. even know that. Dude, we watched we watched all of them when when uh <laughs> our favorite one was like MFM goes. Oh, to, the black crows or, or what I don't remember. Or oh, the black eagles or whatever, and they're just big crows. I don't know if that <laughs> yeah. was the episode. Yeah, for that. sure. Um, Marco was crushing it dude, up there. Yeah, Marco was up there and it was that was our that was our favorite thing to watch this winter. <laughs> so, so those things are still living, dude. The flip sides. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah, no, they're chilling. <laughs> so uh, I have another Patreon question for you. Clean Sage. Oh, this is first from Jeremy Richardson. Sage, you've ticked off a bunch of goals over your career. Are there any specific goals you have for the coming winter? And how do you reset yourself each year to keep setting the bar higher and higher? 
Cool. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, coming in this winter, I'm um, me and Jerem are doing real snow. So what? Yeah, real real snow is an all mount. It's an all mountain one, or it's kind of whatever you want. Now it's backcountry park rails, whatever you want it to be. So we'll be doing that. Um, you know, we have filming till the end of January, and then I got my eyes on the natural selection tour for sure. Um, the first event in February, and I want to that. You know, that's huge goal of mine. I would love to. You know, start that off good, and I think what Travis is doing with that is really rad. I think snowboarding needs it. So excited to, to step into that type of stuff for sure. Dude, you in real snow, that's going to be sick. And you're going to be pitted against the street dudes too. No, it's, oh, it's, it's separate real snow and then real street. Yeah. It's just real. It's just, they're just real switching anything. It. Real yeah, anything. Real anything. So yeah, some dude might be doing all yeah, street. D- yep. Totally. You're going to be doing, you can oh, do that's park, park, pal, yeah, all dude, it. that's yeah. going to be a hell yeah, of a pie, Yeah. Yeah. So I've heard of, it's a pretty good crew. So look out for that. Good well, for you, Doug. Well, I'll tell you oh, what. Thanks. We've been chatting for a long time, and I have a very special gift that we created here at the bomb hole. And what it is is a Sage Kossenberg <laughs> Certified King of Banter Award. <laughs> wow. Bomb hole approved for the listeners, and it's a it's like a little uh, my framed uh, <laughs> plaque, if you will. It's actually just a printed out piece of paper. I like that. But My, f- um, my favorite thing is that it, it's spelled wrong. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> dude, your name's hard to spell. It is. Dude. I'll no, tell you what. I was, that last I was labeling photos. It took me years to get. Oh your shit yeah, right. no. It's, Until we like went to Mermans together. Like I was just talking about that Super Mermans Park launch. Yeah. Like, the fact that it's spelled wrong makes it even makes better. It even better. <laughs> that's no, incredible. That's you uh, are a banter boss. The no, banter we, we god, did dude. banter. You got a god of an award there. I'm Woo. glad I came. Were you not going to give that to me if I kind of had a well, I, 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 I had a plan to not bring it up if you if you had tanked. Yeah, you yeah. would not have received the reward. Wow, yeah. so that's yeah. good. This yeah. was like based on your performance. That's yeah. good. No, that was really good. I yeah, like dude. That. Um, you got anybody you want to thank before we take this thing away or anything like that? Uh, yeah. You know, I mean. I'd like to thank everyone that supported me through all the years, through all the ups and downs and everything. Every Everyone's been so supportive um, from my family to friends, sponsors. And uh, yeah, I, I love it. Love it all. Love snowboarding. And uh, yeah, continue to do so. Thanks, everyone. Beautiful. Well, we really appreciate you coming on our show. And uh, we got another one next Wednesday. So we appreciate you guys listening and watching. We will see you next week.